Good morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, ninth and I think our final uh, workshop or focus group on the master plan and, and what we're planning on doing and proposing for the uh, coming uh, couple of years. So <clears throat> my name is Gordon Broom and I'm the president of the QRPOA. I feel like I should be Seeing the YMCA song. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes out that way, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, and I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the board of directors and uh, your management team. Uh, I think you're going to have a very uh, enjoyable morning. You're going to learn a lot and you're going to find out exactly what we have in mind for the, for the next uh, couple of years. But this didn't just start today. Uh, this is not the uh, beginning of this process. This is really the end of the process. As, as you know from, from the reports we've been giving the town hall meetings and, and what's on your mind, uh, articles and what have you, uh, the master planning uh, process has been going on for a number of years. And, and we have had a lot of your fellow members involved in this process. <clears throat> we, the board of directors approved the master plan in its totality, and uh, you, you saw that in that report, it involves 10 or 11 different projects, uh, which will be performed or completed, hopefully, over the, the coming years. But uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different projects on that plan. There are three projects that we have selected to be what we call phase one. And, and again, we, we've uh, promoted that and talked about that in different uh, forums. So we're gonna be talking about today, the projects in phase one. Phase one is uh, the three projects in phase one are the South Gate. And I don't think there's a single person here at Coyle Ridge that doesn't think we need to do something about the South Gate. I mean, uh, you remember it's sort of like playing chicken every time you go out of this uh, place. So <clears throat> looking to your left and right and hoping nobody's coming. So. So we have a very interesting plan uh, on how to modify South Gate, the South Gate. Uh, the, the other project is, uh, of course, the Tennis Pavilion. The Tennis Pavilion is the last standing building uh, from the original buildings here uh, built at Quail Ridge in the mid 70s, or early 70s. So it's, uh, if those of you who've been here for a while, you know this building here is a, is a new building. Uh, we had the old administration building set for the practice uh, facility is now. Uh, <clears throat> the maintenance shed was a, another major project that we completed several years ago. And, and then since then, of course, we've had the clubhouse, which is a major, major development. And, and then uh, most recently, the South Course. So <clears throat> the one, all those projects have been done and now we're moving on to the next phase. What, when we put the master plan together uh, a year or so ago, we, we hired professionals to help us decide uh, what space we had and what would be the best use of the space. The uh, architectural firm that we were involved in the process was Peacock and Lewis. And Peacock and Lewis is the architectural firm that designed our clubhouse. Uh, we also hired an a, a engineering firm called WGI who's helped design the engineering on the South Gate. And of course, we've got the North Course, which is the third project, which is already well underway. And we have a, one of the national uh, nation's leading architectural firms, uh, Fry and Straka, who uh, have designed uh, that course. So we have those people here <clears throat> for you to, and we'll actually present to you <clears throat> the details of their, of, their, of their plans, of our plans. So you're going to hear from Brian Idle, who's from Peacock and Lewis, and he's going to talk about the South Gate project, and he's going to talk about the tennis pavilion. And, and you're going to get to actually see the floor plans and the renderings of what that building is going to look like. 
and something I think you'll be very pleased to see. Uh, we also have Jason Stricka here from the Fry Stricka uh, architectural firm, uh, Goff architectural firm, who's going to go through something you've all been waiting and, uh, to see and anxious to see, a whole by whole analysis, description of each of the 18 holes as they will uh, be designed uh, uh, on the North Course. So that, that I know we put some of that information out, but you're going to see it in detail with some overlays and it's a very interesting, informative process. So then uh, the other thing we're going to see, uh, that you probably weren't prepared to, to know about or when you came here, is we're going to be doing a lot of different of the buildings around uh, the North Course as part of that project. It'll be a South, South Course turn building. Uh, and I think those of, of you who've been here for a while are looking forward to having something on the, at the turn of the South Course. Uh, we'll have a new building for that. We have a new building plan for the South Gate, a new building plan for uh, Rob to sit in when he directs the traffic. So all of this will be consistently done uh, to compare with the, the, the clubhouse that we had. So, <clears throat> so you're going to see a lot of a lot of things here. Uh, and finally, what's uh, what's on all of your minds? In our minds is what's this going to cost and what's it going to cost me <clears throat> so <clears throat> bill's going to will present the, the detail on the cost what as, as we've now projected it and you'll see that andy translo has done his magic again and uh, you'll be amazed at uh, what we're going to be able to do for the cost it's going to cost each of us so the one thing <laughs> I, I do want to uh, say though that this is not as i said earlier this is not the the first time this, these projects have been considered by the membership. The Golf and Green Committee, the Finance Committee, the Long Range Planning Committee, and we, we also had a Master Planning Committee made up of many of these same people. And we had a North Course Improvement Committee made up of many of the same people on all these different groups. So all these plans we're going to be seeing today have been reviewed by many of your members who are directly involved in the various aspects. The Tennis and Fitness Committee has looked over the, the Tennis Pavilion. The Golf and Green Committee have reviewed uh, and, and the North Course Improvement Committee have been through all of the, the uh, uh, North Course design. So there's been a lot of input from many, many of your members. But the reason we're doing this is so you can be informed of what we're trying to do what we want to do, but also so we can get your input. There's never an end to the good ideas, and you need to know what's going on so you, you can have your input. If you have a question, you have an idea, that's what we want you here to, to express. So we can take that in, share it with our professionals, and incorporate whatever idea you have in the, in the process. So this is our club. You know, we are a member-owned club, so we all have a right to speak up and say what's on our mind and, and have our input. So that's the process. There have been a, a lot of you folks, a lot of our, our, I should say you folks, our members, we members have shown up for these meetings and we've had a lot of great discussion about uh, these programs. So the one thing I, I want to say on behalf of the board too, uh, we have been committed to improving Quail Ridge to keep it a viable and vibrant community. And, and I think uh, the work we've done in the past, the, the investment we've made in Quail Ridge in the past has paid off in many ways uh, in, into our benefit. First off, uh, you know, the clubhouse process, many of us were here when that was going through. We had this, these kinds of focus groups, these kind of discussions, and we had different ideas. And we, we came up with a great uh, clubhouse. I think it fits our needs and we're very pleased with it. Uh, the other thing is, as you know, the membership uh, interest in Quail Ridge increased dramatically after that clubhouse was completed. And, and now uh, we are in a great position with our prior investments. We put ourselves in a great position to ride through the 
of what happens in Florida. If you've been coming to Florida as long as I have. You know, you've seen the ups and downs, you've the highs and the lows. I mean, they're big swings. It's like a roller coaster ride. And unfortunately, I'm always seems like I'm always selling low and buying high. You know, like, but but here we are in a boom like never before. And because of the positioning of the oil ridge, we've had a tremendous demand for people that people wanting to find a location in South Florida. So we want to keep that investment going. And the board, every time we have a meeting, many of the people speak up on the board and say, we want to continue to invest in Quail Ridge and keep it a viable and, and, and interesting uh, community. So, so with that, uh, I think uh, you're going to enjoy what you're going to see today. I think you'll be impressed with the work that's gone into it. Uh, and and there will be a question and answer time at the conclusion of of the program, and uh, uh, and then then at the end we'll have you take a survey and uh, as to what uh, what you think of the program and what you think of these projects. The one last thing I want to say is that because of the tremendous demand that we've had uh, for Quail Ridge and interest in Quail Ridge, as you all know, we've taken in over 170 members in the last two years. Timing of our projects could not be better. If the one thing I want to say is we have uh, we have north of eight million dollars that's in uh, that's in the bank that we can apply to these projects. So as you look around, we are the beneficiaries of what's gone on in the past and what and where we are today. So with that, those funds can all be applied to these projects. And my one input on this is let's spend it. This is uh, let's us take advantage of it. We've earned it. Let's use it, and the future generations will have the same benefit. But we've got the we've got the money in the bank. We've got the projects. Let's continue to invest in Quail Ridge and, and keep it going. So, with that, uh, I want to uh, introduce Brian Idol, who will start with uh, from Peacock and Lewis. We'll start with uh, the program. So, here we go. Mr. Broom, and uh, thank all of you for uh, participating in this process, which uh, has very much been a member driven process for defining this first phase of a multi phase master plan. Um, I will say that investing in, in yourself and investing in infrastructure is one of the things that we have found. There's a company called Club Benchmarking, uh, headed up by Ray Cronin. And Ray was a member of a board at, in a club in Massachusetts 20 some years ago. And they were going through a, a valley at their club. And, you know, they, he, he just started, he's an accountant by, by uh, profession. And, and he started a, a data mining process of, of finding out why some clubs succeed at a very high level, some clubs suffer. And uh, he cracked the code. And after kind of coming up with many uh, aspects of, of club success, the one common denominator was a continual reinvestment in the infrastructure. When clubs are successful, they build on their success. And uh, just as Mr. Broom pointed out, the, the shot in the arm that the new clubhouse provided Quail Ridge, uh, these other investments uh, in further improvements will continue to make Quail Ridge a, a highly desired community by people moving to Florida. And there have been a few people moved to Florida um, <laughs> over, the, over the past couple of years. I know that the, the pandemic, when it first hit, we were very concerned. We didn't know quite know what direction we were going to be heading in, but uh, soon it, it became evident that um, people do like breathing fresh air. People do like getting out in the sunshine. Uh, people do like outdoor dining uh, and outdoor sporting activities. And so golf, tennis, aquatics, uh, being outdoor, uh, Florida was the beneficiary of the pandemic. And so we, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, live in an environment where we can uh, get out and uh, breathe that fresh air. And so all of our architectural designs at our clubs and clients across the nation 
uh, have been influenced by what we learned during the pandemic. Um, so uh, you're not in this alone. Uh, we have been uh, working with many, many clubs across the nation. Uh, although our primary focus is South Florida, we have a North Palm Beach office and a Naples office. And in that parallel, we service over 230 private clubs uh, in, the, in South Florida. So we live in the highest concentration of private clubs in the world. And uh, the state of Florida has about 600 clubs and the, and the nation has about 6,000. So we have about 10% of the clubs in the state of Florida. So uh, what we often do uh, when we're asked to come back to a project where we've worked before and look at the, the site, the club property from about a thousand feet, we look for opportunities. We look at, you know, member patterns. How, are, how have things changed since the new clubhouse was built? What are some of the things that we need to complete uh, that we started with our thinking when we did the clubhouse? and uh, then look for other opportunities on site. So we developed a multi-faceted master plan. And then what we did is we picked what were those elements that the members felt were most important. Uh, yeah, good point. Um, um, and so uh, it included uh, certainly the first impression uh, coming on, you know, into the property off the South Gate, uh, off a of golf road. Uh, you know, coming through uh, the parking lot. And I don't know if any of you were here from the beginning, but Quail Ridge was really founded and, and, and branded as a tennis community uh, that had gone. And so, uh, you know, what, what was originally created by Mr. Dodge on this property was uh, a very vibrant tennis program. And he created this uh, tennis facility that had elevated views of the courts and not too many communities have that. And so that was kind of a distinguishing factor uh, that, that set Quail Ridge apart from the others. Later came uh, fitness. Uh, it seems like all of our clubs, uh, the highest, um, the, the most frequent uh, improvement at most clubs over the past 10 years has been either establishing a fitness program or expanding a fitness program. And uh, certainly you've done that and followed that national trend. It seems like the better the culinary program, the bigger and better the fitness program becomes. <laughs> so uh, we look for opportunities to add uh, croquet courts, uh, kind of the natural matric matriculation from a golf serious community, uh, from Bermuda grass out on a golf course is Bermuda grass on a nice, uh, croquet environment. So, uh, and then we looked at the dump and we said there's probably a higher and better use for that refuse collection area uh, and uh, pickleball. I don't know if anybody's heard of pickleball in the room. Of course they have. It's uh, one of the fastest growing sports um, in, in all of our clubs. And Naples is actually now the pickleball capital of the world. So we said, you know, maybe in the future, uh, you know, if you want it, uh, we, we can provide it. Uh, in, in a very uh, organized way that, that kind of consolidates the pickleball community. But today, let's talk about phase one. You never get a second chance to uh, make a first impression. And so when we, Peacock and Lewis was founded in 1961, uh, and we were developing communities from the beginning, helped de developing the skyline and developing gated golf course communities. And this was the state of the art. You put a little uh, hut out close to the road and you would kind of show that you had a secure community. Um, and uh, I don't know, has anybody noticed that there's a little more traffic on the road today? A little bit, yeah. And it, it, and it, and it gets a little uh, more active. Uh, you know, we come off of that racetrack that we call I-95 and then we come on to <laughs> Woolbright Road and then we come on to Congress and you get the golf road and big sigh of relief. Made it home. I survived. And so you come through that uh, canopy of ficus trees and you say, boy, you know, things are changing. And I, I started coming on, on to Golf Road over 40 years ago. I had moved down from the University of Illinois in Champaign with my wife. And uh, we were asked to be part of a, 
an alumni association and there was this golf pro at, at Country Club of Florida, John Fleming, who just retired. And, um, and so we were coming and I'd come onto that Country Club of Florida property and said, oh my gosh, this is like nothing I've ever seen. And same thing can happen here at Quail because you've got that serenity of the golf course. And when you pull onto your property, you get that great view down number 17 and that water feature. Um, so we love that aspect and sense of arrival into a community. The difference here is that because of the stack, this what you have today would never pass any current code because you need a lot more stacking distance for cars to get off the major roadway and onto your property. So as we've been developing communities in the past 10 to 15 years, we we're providing uh, a, a better sense of arrival into a community. And so this diagram shows you it's line work uh, placed over an aerial photograph. And again, looking for opportunity coming through the canopy of trees into a deceleration lane and into the property. Now there would be signage, you know, we would, we would have plantings and signage uh, both sides of that entryway that says, welcome to Quail Ridge. And, uh, and for members who are very familiar with the property and don't want to go through this whole sequence of arrival and sense of discovery, you're going to bypass that activity and go through the member lane. Your transponder is going to hit the, the gate, you're going to go up, and you're either going to turn right or left uh, to go on Quail Ridge Drive. The, the guests, the people coming for a golf event, a tennis event, uh, card playing, a, a, a charity event at the clubhouse or a lecture, uh, or just coming to see you, uh, they're gonna go through the guest lane. And you can see how many cars that we're showing we can begin to stack. There's just five there, but you can get five more. So we want to get like a 10 car stacking opportunity. We hope that we can process them quicker than that. There won't be 10 cars there. But, uh, but certainly we're gonna get the opportunity to get 10 cars off a of golf road and in the queue and still not in any way inhibit the member lane. Because the member lane is also going to be the emergency vehicle access lane. So if an ambulance is showing up or a, or a fire truck is coming into the property, the, the guards see that. Uh, we're going to provide, you can see we're showing now 20 feet of lane width there to get through. So you can actually, I don't know if you were trained like I was, but I always was trained when an emergency vehicle is coming, you pull off to the side. Not in Florida. <laughs> you actually jump in front of the emergency vehicle. <laughs> and, uh, I, mean, I don't quite get it, but uh, at any rate, uh, but we're giving you an opportunity to kind of pull off to the side, let the emergency vehicle get through. Um, and then if you if you're uh, coming through the guest lane, Liz, uh, if you you know call ahead, you've got your guest passes printed uh, or your transponder, you can certainly uh, pull off. Uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to pull off there as well. But once a guest gets their credentials and they come in, they're going to come right back to that same position and then look down that long axis of 17 and say, wow. This is pretty impressive. So what we did is we took the line work and we put it over an aerial photograph. Um, and then we began to Photoshop in the different pieces. And we actually designed a little building that's a quite a bit different than most guardhouses that you, you're used to seeing. Because our emergency vehicles can bypass, we don't have to have the oversized canopies on this building, but we do provide an opportunity for guests to pull through the building rather than to pull up next to a building. And a couple of days ago, we were here and the, the showers came through and nothing is more frustrating than coming to a guardhouse, rolling your window down and, and having the water come in. And as they're processing uh, your, your license and making sure that you uh, have been called in. And so this new design is gonna allow you, the guest to actually pull through a canopy, have Liz on one side, have the security guards on the other side. And in plan, uh, you can see how that looks. We, we have a small little uh, building, very small with a couple of guards, big windows looking out to the driveway to both the guest lane and to the member lane. 
We have uh, a little washroom area there, a little self-contained kitchen. Uh, all of the keys for those that want to leave keys in the uh, to the guards, they're there on the wall. Uh, Liz has a little business office, a little storage room, little porch each side. Again, part of the the concept here is not only to create a very functional uh, building, but something that is aesthetically pleasing and you know really sets the tone of what you're going to see in the community when you get to the to the uh, clubhouse and to the other amenities. So when you see the building, and these renderings are just slightly stretched vertical, uh, that's what PowerPoint does to them, but you can see that the guest lane is going to terminate right through uh, the center of that building into a canopy. Uh, they can look left, talk to the security guards, look right if they're gonna try to get uh, pick up any credentials from Liz. And then the, the member lane is right there in the foreground. And, There'll be beautiful plantings, and it could be very park-like. You, you know, it could be uh, a lot of the natural uh, uh, landscaping, or we could enhance it with some uh, Bermuda grass around the building to again set kind of set the tone of what you're going to see once you get through the gate. Um, when we get to the tennis pavilion, again, we looked at different ways to come up with a long-term solution for that building. And after looking at the many options, we decided that the current footprint uh, in that location was best. Um, Mr. Dodge hit the bullseye from the very beginning and uh, created this park-like setting coming off of the uh, parking lot onto a path through a garden area to a front porch and then into the building. And the big difference between this building and what was created originally is from the second floor is a 360 degree view. So regardless of where you are in that building, you're either looking west, north, south, or east to the courts. And depending on the prevailing breezes or uh, the talent that you see on the different courts, uh, you'll pick your favorite spot and uh, view the activity. We also want, because there's so much inner club play uh, and, and, and folks really love coming to Quail Ridge uh, for that inner club play, uh, we want to provide an after tennis experience, <clears throat> pardon me, that uh, is second to none. Pardon me, so what we're going to do uh, is create at that elevated level uh, an after tennis uh, opportunity for food and beverage, uh, watching more uh, tennis on a national basis or international basis, depending where the uh, tennis tournaments are being played. We also wanted to provide a West Garden area. So we've removed some of the functional side of a tennis building, uh, the places where hard crew is stored and the brushes and rollers and uh, uh, ball machines, things like that are stored. And we're gonna uh, remote those. Uh, uh, Scott and his team can still get to them, but we really wanna create that nice little hamlet uh, right there in and among the courts. So the floor plan, uh, very much like the roof plan, you can see that you can approach the building either from east to west or west to east, and you're gonna have uh, a little porch area with some umbrella tables, and then it transitions to soft seating groupings a uh, little outdoor furniture, uh, could even be fire tables uh, as you get into the evening hours, kind of a, 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 a evening uh, opportunity in this location as well. But the buildings, the air conditioned space in this building is pretty much similar to what you have today. So the, the retail shop, we do provide a little more office space for Scott and his team, uh, and then a little more storage, but generally the shop uh, about the same. And then we've got the locker room space. We've added a few fixtures uh, in the locker room. And of course it's ADA compliant. So the, the, the rooms are a little bit bigger, lockers slightly bigger, grooming area, uh, and then the uh, housekeeping uh, component to a washroom. So they do stay clean and uh, towels are there. And, um, and so with the other thing you're going to notice in this plan, there's a breezeway that cuts north to south right through the center of the building. So there's very 
you know, never a, a very long walk to get to where you want to go. And we did include an internal stair and a ADA compliant elevator as well for the vertical circulation getting to the upper level. Um, there are two egress stairs on the corner uh, required by code, uh, but we did add an internal stair for again, if the if a storm cloud blows up and we have uh, a little bit of precipitation falling, we can get vertical through the building without getting wet. When you get up to the upper level, it, it's pretty much the same footprint uh, on the upper level. The big difference uh, that you're going to see though is that 360 degree viewing opportunity under cover. Uh, the roof line projects out uh, about two feet beyond the, the terrace line and the column line. And then we added two little thrust balconies that, that actually cantilever off the building. So you're actually projected out about five feet over the courts. And it's gonna be a, a, a very exciting way to view tennis in those uh, four central courts. The inside air conditioned space, uh, we will have the, the wall of fame there with trophies displayed and memorabilia. Uh, a little hospitality counter that is portable, but has built-in refrigeration and a bar sink in the wall, uh, an opportunity to stage food and beverage up at that upper level. And this design actually incorporates what we did for you in the clubhouse and the grill room. On a nice day, the walls will open up to the outdoor covered patio and uh, it expands the space very naturally for uh, bigger groups to gather. Uh, but it also gives you that, that great uh, outdoor feel to the space. We did also uh, have the little multi-purpose room that is currently down on the lower level is going to come up to the upper level. That's going to provide great viewing uh, and business from that level. Also, for those that want to gather for a book club or an art club or a, a Bible study or whatever it is you want to do, uh, a nice small room that, again, opens up to the uh, outer terraces. And one of your members suggested that maybe that entire wall could open up and then that, that space could even feel bigger on a nice day. And that thought that was a great suggestion. We also are showing um, washrooms up here. So everything is kind of self-contained at that upper level. And then when the event is over, you could go down uh, the internal stair, the corner stairs or the elevator uh, to get down to the lower level. So with the help of some Photoshop here, we took a drone shot of the neighborhood and the clubhouse there to the east, the cart barn, the parking, and then we kind of laid in the tennis courts as they exist today, and then dropped in a little scale model of the building. And again, this is a little stretched vertically, but the whole point of it is what we want to do is create a similar architectural aesthetic and vernacular as the current clubhouse with the classical order uh, the cornice line, the roof tiles, uh, a very transparent feel to the building on the perimeter with just the masses uh, in the center. And then when we get inside, uh, we want to provide you uh, the same quality level that you expect when you go to the clubhouse. You're going to have the same quality level here at the tennis pavilion. Um, it's going to have a retail shop, you know, in the same spirit and flavor as the golf shop uh, in the main building. Uh, plenty of display of apparel, uh, racket frames. Uh, you can get uh, you know, things re-gripped. You can get new stringing in the rackets. You can actually watch a, a tournament from the shop. There will be you know, headwear, footwear, apparel, probably some sunglasses, sunscreens, things like that uh, that are dispensed in the shop. When you get upstairs, uh, this will kind of project a whole, well, slightly different than what you have today. Um, it, it's going to, like I say, embody that same spirit that you've come to love uh, in, in your clubhouse. And like I said, the, you know, the wall of fame and the, and the ability to support food and beverage, the ability to open a wall and, and kind of transition to that outdoor terrace overlooking uh, the tennis courts. When you kind of turn the camera back the other direction, it's a lot more transparent. And it's only through the technology, the, the, you know, the development of glass and lighting and HVAC systems over the past 10 to 15 years that allows us to create spaces like this that, you know, just are full of natural daylight. And when the sun isn't shining, you can actually recreate a daylit situation 
with the artificial illumination. So, uh, you know, never, never again should you be walking around here with a scowl on your face. This is, you know, it's always smiles here forward. You know, everything's very uplifting. And so the, even when you're out on these, these outdoor terraces, the, the, these little outdoor living rooms, comfortable furniture, looking through glass rails, down to the activity on the tennis courts. When we got over to the short game practice area, the, uh, the teen area of the driving range, the putting greens, the turn of golf and the start of golf, we would look at many locations for the south turn stand. And so we, 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 we kind of worked it around. We talked to Jason and his team, what, what would be a good location, Bill and the management team, you know, everybody had a little input. And what we did is, uh, you know, took a knob off of the corner here and provided some more uh, parking for bicycles, golf cars. Uh, you're a very active community that way with the bicycles and golf cars. And so we wanted to um, also provide a building that would support morning time activity, the golf activity at the turn, and uh, even activity of watching uh, either your friends or your grandchildren putting on the putting green or hitting balls on the, on the range. So this new building, uh, again, it's kind of self-contained. It has a breezeway through the center to get from north to south. It has some seating outside uh, with some landscaping around it so that if you want to get a morning coffee and a muffin and uh, relax, check your electronics, uh, uh, see what's going on in the world before heading out. You could do that, or you could sit on the north side of the building and look at the activity on the driving range or the putting green. It has a little indoor component to it, uh, a wall that you could grab and go uh, if you want, or you could order something. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we're, we don't have a hood here, but we, we have the ability to make something for you uh, in front of you. So. It's gonna be, uh, uh, again, in the same architectural feel as the clubhouse. It's nice, a little garden building here set amongst a beautiful garden setting. It too would have the, the, the folding wall so that on a nice day like today, boy, all the doors should be open today. Uh, can this day and bring it back. Um, and then Rob and his, his little domain. Uh, so somebody put Rob right in the middle of a lot of cart traffic there, but uh, it's a good spot from the standpoint of, you know, seeing what's going out on the, on the golf courses and returning back and practicing. But we wanted to move Rob to the side and give him a little more space, add a bathroom, add a nice water machine for those that are out on the short game area so that they don't have to come back to the clubhouse. Everything we're doing is kind of facilitating flow. Um, you know, in and around the spaces and member enjoyment. So this little building, uh, Rob is going to have views looking out to the different holes, uh, the starting and turning holes out to the practice facility. Like I said, a powder room here and a little front porch to the building so that it too blends very naturally with the architecture of the clubhouse and has the appearance that everything was built at one time. So I mentioned member enjoyment, um, and uh, you know that was just a very, very quick run through of what phase one buildings, the vertical side of this phase one is all about. What we're gonna now do is talk about the horizontal side um, of what phase one is. And Jason uh, Straka, who you're going to hear from next, has pretty much dedicated his life to creating golf courses that are not only visually appealing, that are fun to play, but have an environmental sensitivity to them. And uh, he was uh, the forerunner in environmental design so that golf courses are good neighbors to the environment. And we've taken a lot of criticism in the past 10 to 15 years that we use too much water, we use too much fertilizer, we do things that are not helpful to the environment. Jason has a whole different slant on this. So, um, so it, it's my pleasure now to introduce the legend, uh, <laughs> Jason Strake. Brian. 
Yeah, you have to can those types of comments so I can bring them back to my wife. <laughs> I'll never forget my wife was with me and I had a client that you know, I, I, we figured something out sometime and, and the gentleman says, he goes, boy, that Jason, he's a genius. So every time that's the joke in our household now. So every time my wife yells at me for something, I say, but don't forget the genius. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I know a little difficult to do because it's so nice outside for sure. Um, Brian's done a wonderful job and his staff and his team uh, putting together some very beautiful 3D elements to this. Uh, we work with Brian on a number of different projects and, and they do fantastic work. So you're very fortunate to have uh, Brian and his team working here at Quail. On the golf side of things, uh, even though you see my face today and, and probably many of you have seen me around the club in the past oh, six, seven, eight months right now, I wanted to take a moment and make sure that you know that we have a very talented team. So it's not just me uh, that's working on the, on the redesign of the North Golf Course. Uh, there are three of us out of our expanded team, my business partner, Dana Fry. Some of you may know Dana or know of him or maybe even belong to some of the courses that he's worked on in the past. Dana's background, a little different than mine. He was a competitive uh, collegiate golfer and then spent um, six years working for Tom Fazio. So he was a shaper for Tom Fazio. And what that means is he did a lot of the artistry work on a bull, physically on a bulldozer, building tees and greens and fairways and bunkers and all the pretty things that you see. Uh, Dana's worked on a number of golf courses, uh, you know, of Tom's that are in the top 100, including like Nona, Black Diamond Ranch, uh, Wild Dunes, uh, Wade Hampton, uh, and many others. So, uh, you know, Dana, as the project goes on, you'll see more and more of him uh, from a construction standpoint, uh, joining myself. Patrick, some of you have probably met, he was here uh, for some of the stakeholder meetings uh, earlier on in the process. I actually taught at Ohio State University for about a decade. Patrick was one of my very first students. Uh, I tell him that he's getting older now. And he just means that he just tells me that I'm a whole lot older now. Mm -hmm. So but Patrick's background is in landscape architecture and turf management and agronomy. So he has multiple degrees. Um, and then myself, as Brian said, I've dedicated much of my professional career towards environmental golf course design. I studied at uh, Cornell University. I know that there's at least one big red in here uh, today. It's always nice to meet fellow alums. Um, when I went to Cornell, I, um, I was very fortunate that I had uh, very well-known professors uh, who were actively involved uh, in the environmental side of agronomy and design. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the world leading uh, scientists. So when I, I actually stayed, I got my master's degree at Cornell as well in environmental golf course design, agronomy, and turfgrass. My master's thesis, now this is going back three decades, but my master's thesis was actually in the development of North America's first environmental demonstration golf course. Now what that means is that we went uh, to the World Wildlife Federation and Sierra Club and all the Audubon groups and the EPA. We brought them together very early on, uh, even before the project was starting to be planned. And so we got together and understood one another and what was important and the environmental principles and all the golf side of things. Uh, professionally then, you know, again, it just continued that dedication um, with my life. I actually get uh, called by the US EPA and Department of Justice to serve as an expert witness. I review some uh, cases and, and sometimes I actually will do expert witness testimony. For example, on certain golf courses that maybe not doing the things that they're supposed to be doing uh, or maybe it permitted for and they didn't do or vice versa. Uh, I also sit on advisory councils for the development of environmental certifications and sustainability practices. So I serve right now as the 75th president of the American Society of Golf Course Architects. Um, one of the councils I sit on is for the Golf Environment Organization. Similar to Audubon Group, which I know that there's an active Audubon Group that's here. GEO is the acronym, GEO is worldwide. Uh, and so um, again, I help write their sustainability uh, principles and, and their sort of certification process. Sorry, it's been a long week. <laughs> nine, nine meetings now, right? So nine meetings. So that, um, that's a bit about my background. I have just a few slides uh, before we actually jump into the actual proposed design, just to talk about a little bit how we got to this point. So I was telling the other groups that this is your eye reading test. You can skip your eye exam here later this month. Seriously though, this is, uh, these are all the different stages of the design process. And I, I'm not expecting you to read these, although you, you'll have this presentation uh, as Mr. Langley will tell you. So you'll be able to go through all this in detail, even at home. 
everything that's in here in gray has already been completed, right? So again, very rigorous process over really the past year. The bottom half of this is actual put pen to paper. In today's world, we put you know things on iPad and, and AutoCAD. The top half of it was all research and analysis. So that was even before we got into any of the design. It was really important for our team to understand what you wanted out of this facility, right? What's important to you as members of Quail, what you want for the North Golf Course, maybe something different than the South Golf Course, right? And so again, we wanna make sure that we are delivering a product that you're really proud of, that's gonna be fun to play in tune with the environment. Right? And so I'll show you a little bit about some of those, what those research pieces look like. Hopefully most of you or all of you participated in the club survey. Right, and so uh, that was a really rigorous survey. We had well, uh, literally hundreds of pages of comments. So typed in written comments. I promise you we read every single one of them. Uh, and that was really important. Again, we're extracting information from all of you. Uh, there were lots of questions, as you well remember, I am sure. Uh, one of the ones that was particularly telling though is that the question was, is it important to you that Quail Ridge is considered to be one of the top private clubs on Florida's uh, Atlantic coast? More than two thirds of you or about two thirds of you said yes. In club statistics, that's actually a really significant uh, amount. And so, you know, it's very important for, for the membership. We broke it down even then by age too. So the younger that you got in the, in the age category, it was even more important to you. And so again, what that means to designers like Brian and I is that, you know, to bring in the, you know, the younger members, the newer members, and to continue how relevant Quail is and make it attractive, it's really important for your facilities, including the golf course, to be considered, you know, among the best. Right. So, so how do we get there? Um, the next stage was doing uh, GPS data loggers. I'm curious, anybody participate in that program or remember it? Nobody wants, or maybe some people don't want to admit it. Nobody knows what's interesting. So there were we tracked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rounds of data uh, of your golf rounds. So you probably were, had talked to some friends and we had these little GPS trackers that were only about the size of a computer thumb drive. And so we asked the members to put it on their belt loop or put it in their pocket. And it was a program that was run through Dan in the pro shop. And so we have, so every line that's here or somebody's round of golf, right? Now we didn't put your name on it. You know, so I didn't <laughs> want to know who your name was. But what we would do is that we would want to know what gender you were and then uh, what handicap you were. So the blue lines are, are the male line or male golfers, the pink lines are the female golfers. And then of course, again, we can break it up by handicaps. You know, this was just a composite where we, you can see men and women combined in all handicaps. And so there are things that we study and, and really try to review and better understand about your golf course. Uh, for example, this is number two north here, and this is number current number nine north is that we would, for example, look for bunkers that, uh, sand bunkers that might be in play for just high handicap golfers, but low handicap golfers hit beyond. Well, if you're a high handicap golfer, you probably don't have the greatest skill. You can get in the bunker easy, but probably can't get out of the bunker as easy. So if you're looking at ways to speed up play and make the golf course more fun, you maybe challenge the better golf course, golf golfers, but you know, make it a little easier for your higher handicaps, we can start to identify hazards that way. We also use it for, uh, for maintenance tracking. So for Christopher and his staff, we were looking for wear patterns, particularly with parts so that we can distribute the wear better and he can maintain the grass uh, you know, more easily and provide you with better playing conditions, right? So there's a whole host of information that we can glean you know, out of this type of research. Again, we haven't done any design work to this, you know, to this, um, to this point yet. We also sat down with hopefully many of you uh, in stakeholder meetings, right? So they weren't focus groups that we just had select people come in. It was open to anybody and everybody. And you came in and we interacted one-on-one -on -one and we talked about, you know, what you liked about the club, what you didn't like about the club, maybe what you wanted to see different from the South Golf Course. And again, you know, days and days worth of, of feedback from all of you. At that point, and only at that point, did we start to actually put our pen to paper. And we went through uh, what we call the schematic design process. And you know, this is the north, there's the range and then north all course is you know, primarily over here. And you'll notice that there's no tees, no fairways, no greens that are on there. We're just looking at the bones of the golf course at this point, right? So we've taken all of that information that we've learned from you and from all those different research pieces. And then we wanted to know, for example, if there were some identified safety issues, is there a way that we can structurally move a golf hole, right, left, you know, do something with it to improve the safety aspect, right, or playability aspect. 
And so we go through multiple iterations of this, working with the improvement committee and the board. By the way, everybody will have this presentation. So um, you go through the board. And so you go through that process until we come to you know, what is a, a proper solution. Then the next step is, is what we call design development. Yeah. Okay, and design development really is that we're developing the design, right? So at that point, you take the schematic process and then you start adding tees, greens, fairways, bunkers, uh, and, and the rest of it. And that's about uh, right about what I'm ready to show you here is the design development. This is the scorecard, okay, for the proposed golf course. Now, these are the physical sets of tees. So you will have six sets of physical tees, right? So, and the new golf course will play all the way down to a length of about 4,400 yards, all the way up to about 7,300 yards. What this doesn't show you though, is that the blended or hybrid sets of tees. So what will happen is that, so for example, if you're uh, you know, looking for maybe a yardage of 6,000 yards here, once the golf course is constructed, Dan and the staff with the Ladies Golf Association and the men's, you know, the MGA would sit down and then say, okay, on hole one, we're gonna use T3, hole two might be T4 and go back and forth until they hit, you know, there'll be sets of blended tees or hybrid tees all through this right here, okay? So just understand that that will be part of the later process. Now, we're also proposing to resequence the golf course, right? So it won't play in the exact order that you, that you know it right now. And I'm gonna describe you know, why and how we did that. And I'm gonna ask Andy, because we're on Zoom, right? So our joke is, is that now I, I need help with this. And so the past couple of days via Zoom, I felt like Pat Sajak, and this is my man of white. <laughs> <laughs> he, needs, he needs high heels, so he doesn't heal. So yeah. we couldn't get him to wear a dress. <laughs> the previous group said they didn't want to see him in a dress. So <laughs> here he goes. Thanks. So this is a, a newer technology that we use. Uh, we call these our slider graphics. And so this is uh, before and after images. So I'm gonna lead you through this uh, hole by hole. Then we actually have some we call precedent images. So another golf course that has similar physical attributes. And then we have some before and after images of a group of select holes. Sorry, a lot of talking. So past few days, just to get everybody oriented here. Is that, so here's the clubhouse, right? The putting green, the practice range key is here, and then your current short game area. So here's number one. So you'll be able to do this at home on your computer, your iPad too. So you can grab the image and click, and then you just slide it across, and you can see the proposed hole. So you can go back and say, well, what are they talking about doing with the green? You can do that, right? So you'll be able to do this in a whole by whole format. Sure. So I want to show you a couple of commonalities, right? That is on hole number one, you know, and then you're going to see over and over again uh, with the other golf holes as well. So not only did we have these target yardages, right, set by the staff and your golf associations, but they actually went through very detailed hole by hole analysis, working with me and our staff to understand how that golf hole is going to play. So for example, you might be playing a 6,000 yard set of tees, but they went through on hole number one and said, okay, based on the dog leg and the ability to, you know, it's tough to get around the corner, right? And they said, so we wanna make sure that everybody can get to the dog leg now so they have a fair shot to get there in two. So in many instances, you know, they inched up a couple of yards there to be able to do that. So again, every hole was analyzed by your golf associations and by Dan and his staff. You'll also notice that your tees are considerably larger uh, in the proposed. So if you pull it across here, you can see these little circles that are here and they're almost all the same size, right? So here we're talking about doing rectangular tees and they're much larger. So we went to Christopher and the staff and we said, okay, for every par four, par three, par five, what's the number of the square footage, the area of your tees, the total amount of tees that you need to be able to maintain excellent tees day to day, month to month, year to year. So he came back and he said, we need X amount of square feet. And then we went to Dan and we said, okay, Dan, you know, based on your membership, what percentage of people play T1, T2, T3? So then we can take that percentage, right? And allocate the proper square footage to each individual tee. You'll notice that these different tees are all different sizes, right? Whereas right now they're all approximately the same circle. 
right? So right now you have a lot of people that might play in one tee, and then you have another tee here that's the same size, and you have nobody that plays there. It doesn't make sense, does it? So again, everything that we do has, you know, it has a focus on maintenance as well. All right, so let's go forward as well. Now, so you'll see here too, is that as we go through this, we're always thinking about uh, the strategy and the difficulty of everybody's different tee shots. So if you ever attended some of the stakeholder meetings, you know, I, I told you that Dana and I had kids and wives and elderly parents that play golf, and it was always a focus uh, of ours, not just, you know, the good players. So you'll notice that, you know, these back tee, you know, so T1, T2, not only is it the longest hole, but they also have the longest and the hardest dog leg, right? And so you'll notice that here. So as you move forward, every set of tee, it's moving slightly to the left in this case. And the reason is that by the time you get to the forward couple of tees, the actual dog leg is really soft so that you don't have to hit the perfect drive to get out to the corner to reach the green, okay? And so this is how we do this to improve playability. The other thing that you'll notice on virtually every single other hole is that by the time you get to the forward couple of tees, there is no forced carry, right? So these tees right here, you literally can puck the ball onto the fairway, okay? So we're always trying to make sure that everybody can have fun and have you know, an enjoyable time. A couple of other commonalities to this is that um, you'll notice a common theme of um, perimeter berming, okay? And so we're going to talk, and I'm going to show you a lot about that. But as you're playing the first hole, you know, the things that Dana and I and Patrick notice uh, as golf course designers is just as Brian said, when you're coming off the, you know, the rat race of 95 or racetrack of 95, and you get in your community and you want to decompress, when you're out on your golf course, we want you to feel tranquil too. I mean, we want to stimulate your senses, you know, and have this wonderful experience and have you think about how you're playing the golf course. But again, we don't want you to be, feel like you're on uh, I-95. As we were analyzing the golf course, you have a lot of places where you've got golf holes that are playing up to roadways, utilities, a lot of noise. And I call it noise, but I also mean not only visual, uh, you know, sort of audio noise, but also visual, right? So on hole number one right now, if you're standing there, I mean, I promise you, you know, and you go out there on Monday or Tuesday, and then all you see is everybody is landscape trucks and carts and, you know, box trucks and everything's driving back and forth there. We don't want to see any of that. When you're playing that golf hole, you just want to have a beautiful garden-like backdrop to it. Now, that's different, though, than what's happening on the internal side of things here, because we also understand that from a homeowner's perspective, is that, you know, the, your property value is incredibly important. So we want to make sure that we're either providing with an equal type of view, or we want to be able to enhance people's views as much as we can, right? So as we go through this, you know, you'll notice uh, I'll talk a little bit about this perimeter berm concept, interior berming, but also in places where we're, we're proposing to enhance people's views. Okay. All right. So that's hole number one. All right. So here's where the deviation starts in the sequencing of the golf course. And I'll explain why. Uh, actually, it was the improvement committee that came to me. It wasn't even my idea. Uh, they came to me and they said, what do you think about renumbering the golf course? So when they told me what they had suggested, I said, you know, we analyze it makes really good sense. And I'll explain why. So everybody wants to have faster golf, right? So nobody wants to say, I want a golf course to, you know, to play longer. And you want, if people do walk like a day like today, where Dan, you know, said, my gosh, he said, you can't believe the number of people walking today. We want to make sure that we can create the shortest walks possible. Okay. So if you think about it, you play hole number one and you finish here and you do this, uh, drive or walk on, you go underneath the, the pass here at Woolbright, and you come across, currently what happens is that you go to the very furthest tee, right? And then you play your loop and you finish at nine here. So here's nine green, you go across at tee to 10 tee, you make the loop and then you finish here at 17. And of course, now what happens is that you have 17 and you have the furthest walk all the way to 18 tee, right? So think about it this way. So you come across and underneath uh, Woolbright here, the very first tee you come to is your current 10th hole. That would become number two, okay? You would play the loop around, your current 17th hole would become then number nine, all right? And then you go right from nine green, the very shortest walk over to what is now two would become 10. You make the loop around, your current ninth hole would become the 17th hole, follow me. And then, oh, by the way, that green is the absolute shortest walk that you would have to your 18th piece. Yes. 
So there's a lot, you know, makes a lot of sense in terms of speeding up play and for walkers uh, as well. Okay. okay. So now I asked because I said, okay. I said, so you've had people that have been some members here for 50 years, almost 50 years. I said, how do we want to present it? They said, well, let's see if we can get them used to it. So I even have to bounce back and forth and go, oh, what hole are we on now? So I'm going to do my best <laughs> to make sure that, uh, that we're all on the same page. So we're actually going to start with current 10, proposed two. And I'm going to go through some of the bigger changes, hole by hole. Notice on number 10, the pond that's here, right? So yeah. everybody tees off on the same tee, gets beat up, not nearly enough tee space, right? Everybody even doesn't, you know, other than this one little forward tee here, everybody else tees off over here. All right, so now look what happens with the pond. Look at the tees, the pond is gone. Okay, so here's what happens. Of course, plenty of tee space now, and then we can spread out all of that traffic and not all the people who shouldn't be playing the very championship tee now will have the appropriate tee length. Pond is gone. And then here's the first instance of what we call the perimeter berming concept. And again, you're gonna see pictures uh, and ideas of that. So when you're playing the 10th hole, uh, you've got power lines and the, the canal and this road traffic is really, really noisy. And as a matter of fact, we talked to even a bunch of the homeowners that are here and they said it's so noisy uh, in this community. So we would have the ability uh, to actually create a landscape berm. So the berm would go up anywhere from eight to 20 feet, depending upon where you're at. And then it would be all re-landscaped and this is all part of the budget, part of the design, part of the plan so that it would really buffer. So when you're playing that new second hole, right? It's a new second hole. You wouldn't be able to see any of the utilities to the right and that road noise would be considerably quieter. Again, tranquil, decompress, you just wanna decompress. Um, a couple of other things that you'll see is that, you know, people have asked, what's the difference between this area and this area? Well, this is all new, new the perimeter berm landscaping. This is all annotations of saved trees predominantly, okay? So we're just showing groups of trees that we would save. Now, the nice thing too, is that with this perimeter berming concept is that most of you, almost all of you have asked and they said, you know, we've got a dead flat golf course. Isn't there any way that you can make it so it's more exciting, right? So ups and downs. So I can't build Colorado here, right? However, is that yes, we can make significant elevation changes for Florida. Sometimes playing uphill and downhill 15 to 20 feet, right? You don't have that even across your entire golf course, that type of elevation change. We'll be able to provide that on many golf holes within one golf hole. So for instance, by removing the pond nets here and doing the perimeter berming, this tee shot here would play roughly 15 feet downhill now. Think about that in Florida, that's pretty significant. All right, so you're getting nice, beautiful, elevated uh, tee shots. And again- Because you elevate the, the tee boxes? These will all be elevated, that's correct. Yep. Let's go over to your 11th hole, which would be the new third hole. So here's the before, here's the pond, right? In part five. And you'll notice, look what happens along the roadway here. So that all becomes perimeter berming. So these tees here would be again, slightly elevated, right? And then part five plays in the same corridor. Now we also, just like Brian and other architects and landscape architects are always looking for improved views. And if you think about when you play this golf hole and you're approaching the green, the green is so elevated that you can't see the, the lake that's behind it, right? So even though this is a 2D map in 3D, this green elevation would actually be lowered. So if you're approaching the green, you would have a beautiful back, uh, the, your backdrop would be that beautiful lake that's there. <laughs> Here is that little par three, which is actually is a nice hole now. Um, although uh, the joke uh, they have been making was that when Mr. Lee you know, first designed these golf courses, he must have been really upset with his wife that day <laughs> because you're moving forward, moving forward. And then he was like, OK, we're going to take the next couple of tees and stick them way over here to the left with the hardest carry and the shallowest angle shot into that green. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. So you're going to give the people who are, should be, are playing the forward tees that should have the easiest shot. And you're giving them the hardest shot possible on that golf hole. So how do we, you know, so how do we change that? Well, notice where these two T's are now and what happens. Okay, so now those two T's come out. Um, you know, we expand the lake. It doesn't come into play anymore for anybody. But then we take these T's, which are obviously significantly larger, and these would be elevated again because they get tied into the berm, right? So this would be another little downhill uh, T shot. 
but every T now you're moving forward and moving right. So that by the time you get to that forward T, for now you have to hit this ridiculous short carry. I couldn't even do it because it'd be right in the middle of yardage. I'd either chunk it in the lake or send it over into the canal. But now you would literally be able to you know, hit a bump and run shot right under the green if that's what you chose to try and do. Now here's a big departure, right? So next hole, which is your current 13th, right? 13th. I get that right? I told you it's going to say, so here's 13, right? So you play this tee shot here. You've got the lake that's on the left, except that you had this bay on the on this far left that you can't see. You can't see the lake that's on the right over here. And you have the absolute narrowest fairway possible. That's not even US open width. That's like half of US open width there. Really? Oh God, yes. I mean, that is so ridiculously hard. And of course it's hidden water and hidden water hazards are never considered good design, right? So just like if you went to an art golf architectural critic or people that rate golf courses, I mean, that's, they would just look at that and go, no, 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 that's just, this is bad. So here's another thing too, by the way, I'm gonna point out. So of course you have the road and then this parcel that's off to the side over here to the right of your current 14th hole. I don't know if anybody knows that that's being developed in soon, right? Mm -hmm. So they've had their first hearing uh, Tuesday, I believe Bill said, right? And then they have their second hearing is next month. So that whole corner, that is going to be surface parking and mid-rise condominiums. So it's not right from, you don't wanna see all that noise again, right? So you want that to be out of sight, out of mind. Okay, so look what the proposal is here. Watch what happens, especially with the lake on the right. Lake is gone. Look at that. So the green is right here. As a matter of fact, the, the dog leg is so hard that it's actually dog legging around these two house lots that are right there. So this green actually gets slid down to down to the right and just a touch shorter. Let me look at this. Okay. Okay. So these T's again would be somewhat elevated, right? So and then the fairway actually gets expanded. So if you're looking at this at home, uh, I want to point something out here is that you should be able to see like the old bunkers that are underneath. If you look hard enough, you'll see these red dotted lines here and you'll be able to see the, the existing fairway line underneath. By and large, the vast majority of your fairways will become significantly wider, right? So what you'll notice is that we'll, we'll take bunkers and we might sort of, they look like they jut into the fairway and we're creating these different strategic angles to it. But if you look at the totality of your fairway width, they're actually much, much wider than what you have right now. So the other thing that happens, of course, is this landscape or perimeter berm that stretches all the way down around. So when this gets developed, it doesn't matter, out of sight, out of mind. You're going to have a nice berm there with plantings on top of it, you know, and, and you should never even, unless they went like super high rise, you wouldn't even see the roof line at all. And then the other thing is that I'm going to point out a couple of different terminologies here. So you'll see it says create large Daytona side slope, or sometimes you'll see some terms on there called kicker side slopes. Much different than your south golf course, right? So think about when you're playing your south golf course, everything is sort of domed, right? So I keep telling people that, you know, hitting into some of the greens is like hitting into the hood of a Volkswagen Beetle car, right? So, I mean, you got to hit the perfect shot, otherwise balls do this. You know, not that that's necessarily bad, it's just a different style. Now for the North golf course, you might have that on one side of the green or a hazard on one side of the green, but we want to be able to give you kicker plates or side slopes so that you can actually hit a bank and then the ball would kick back onto the green in some instances. So same thing can happen with fairways. And the term Daytona was actually coined by Pete Dye and must have liked the Daytona racetrack. Racetracks aren't flat, right? So if you look at the Daytona racetrack, it's tipped. So when the cars are going around it, that gravity is holding it in place. So he said, let's, you know, he goes, when we do these kicker slopes, it's kind of like the Daytona racetrack. So we build the Daytona. So what happens is that if you hit the ball down the right-hand side, the right edge of this fairway will actually be tipped. So you can avoid this lake altogether. You can hit it down this right-hand side and just let the ball feed right around the fairway and then towards the green. Same thing with the fairway uh, approach to the green. You know, I would love to have interclub matches because hopefully your opponent goes first. And they're here and the next thing you know, they've tried to hit it to the green and they've dumped it in the water. And then you aim way out to the right, you use the slope and then you just feed right onto the green. And then you let them get mad at you and say, too bad you didn't know that. So, <laughs> <Should've asked. laughs> All right. 
14, again, similar because this is, uh, again, this is the out parcel being developed. We've actually proposed to shorten this golf hole and you'll notice one lake, two lakes, yeah. right? And so we call this a drivable or reachable par four. If anybody likes to watch professional golf when they play the Genesis Open, the most, one of the most famous drivable or short par fours in the world is attempt at Riviera, right? So it, it gives the pros fit. Sometimes you make a two, sometimes, a lot of times you make threes. And then the other times they're making sixes and thinking, how the heck did I do that? So look what happens with those two lakes. Here comes a shorter golf hole and the two lakes are gone. So the perimeter berming goes all the way down this hole. And we do have a before and after 3D image of this, which we'll see towards the end of the presentation. This hole would actually play uphill roughly 20 feet. So you're, you're climbing from a low here and then this just rides all the way up to the right hand, uh, excuse me, up to the green setting here. Again, we talked about uh, this schematic design, and I'm going to show you this is a perfect instance of how that, that phase of the design works. Meeting with all of you and going through the surveys, we knew that this was a safety issue on this hole. And I'll show you why. Of course, this is the, the, the entrance in the guard house that's right here. But look at the angle of the center line of the hole. Right, so you look at that black line, right, and it's angled towards the road. Okay, so this is I was telling the other groups this is the tip of the day, right? So, and I'm sure that many of you know this, at least I hope so. Is any time that you have a hazard, right, on one side of the hole when you're teeing off, you actually want to move closer to the hazard, right? So if there was a lake or a road out of bounds, like over here on the right, like in that case, move to the right side of the tee box because then you actually play away from away from the hazard. Okay, so you'll notice though that that center line is actually playing towards the hazard. Now, GPS trackers, and you look at that hole, you know, I was joking with the other groups too, is that you see some of these lines and it crosses the road over here. I know you weren't going to visit friends. It was because you sliced the golf ball across the road. We're going to go get your golf ball. Okay, so how do you fix that? So watch what happens with this line now, right? So the before and after. Right, so there's the before. Watch how it changes in the after. You see the angle of it changing? Yeah. Okay. So what does that do? So we've actually taken the tees, we've shortened them a little bit, we've moved them to the right, and we've taken the green and we slightly slid it to the left. So now that angle is playing further away from the road. Now the other thing that we've done is that we put a hazard, in this case one lone bunker on the right, and you'll notice, as I said, that almost everything has you know open area bailout. In this case, the bailout's left of the hole. So we're doing everything that we can to get you to hit away from the road. And if you want to miss, miss left, okay? So better safety-wise. Of course, still not here, Bill? No. no. I'm to, I wanted to meet the gentleman or the family or the lady that lives in this house. They have the, the greatest putting green. So the putting green stays. They have to be the best putter in the club. So that stays. <laughs> Okay, on to your current 16th. Again, some fairly big changes here, All right? So this would be your proposed uh, eighth hole. Okay, so here's the waste bunker, right? The canal, and the canal, when, the, when they first built it, this is actually original how they built it. They didn't build it straight across, but they tried to bend it. And the reason they're trying to bend it is that for longer players, they're trying to give as much run out. So you don't want to hit the perfect drive only to run into the, to the canal. But the other problem is, is that so, of course, now, you know, even 50 years later, think about tech, the, the increase in technology. So you're better players, you know, they can easily hit it into that. The other problem, though, is, is that for most other people, it's difficult to get across in two, right? So you have people that are trying to lay up or then, you know, try to hit across. And I mean, I've seen people that are trying to aim for the bridge to run the ball across. I mean, <laughs> that's not good goal. <laughs> So the other thing that's happening is that these homes over here, anybody live there by yeah. chance? You see some traffic, golf balls? A lot of golf balls. A lot of golf balls, yeah, all right. So, the ditch. <laughs> yeah. so you'll like this change here because we want to make sure that we can do everything that we can to, to help alleviate some of that. You don't like you know, having golf balls in your yard and I'm sure that you know, your fellow members, I mean, I don't like it when I'm have, you know, feeling that I'm going to hit it in somebody's house. That's not fun either. No. Okay, so let's let's look at some of the changes that are here. All right, watch what happens. Okay, so a couple of things. So one of which is that waste bunker goes away, new lake. That's where some of the fill material for the perimeter burning comes from. Okay.
okay? The second thing is, is that the canal is now gone. So we would actually pipe and it's in the budget, right? So it's budgeted for, so that's all part of the, the estimates and the financial package. So from the left out of bounds marker to the right out of bounds marker, it was underground, completely gone. Better players don't have to worry about hitting into it. Other players don't have to worry about trying to get over it too or laying up. It's a par five. Hit it as hard and as far as you want to now. Second thing is, is that again, if you notice that angle, we've shifted by, we shifted this angle slightly. So these T's move to the right some, you know, before that angle was like this and we've shifted that angle so that we can hit away from these homes more now. And then we, the fairway slid just a little bit to the left. And then right now the bunkers that are there, you know, and, and this gentleman I'm sure can testify to this, we call those volcano bunkers. And what I mean by that is that somebody built a big mound and then they hollowed out the top of it like a caldera and that called the bunker. Well, if you hit in the bunker, okay, my ball gets stuck in the bunker. But if I hit the side of the bunker, where does it go? And that gentleman's yard hits and just rockets to the right. We don't want to build the bunkers like that. We actually want to build the bunkers so they're saving bunkers. So the fairway is at this elevation, the bunker is a little bit lower. So it does two things. One of which is that it's telling you don't aim right, aim left and stay away from them. If you do happen to go into the bunker though, those are saving bunkers. So they're actually meant to capture the ball. They're not gonna have that type of slope I just described and take balls out of bounds, okay? So a couple of nice big changes there. This is your current 17th hole, uh, which would be your proposed ninth hole. There is gonna be one change that we're gonna make because we met with these different homeowners that are here. And at first we were proposing to remove this lake in its entirety, but we're gonna just move it over closer uh, to the tee boxes. But notice what happens here on 17. Okay. So when you're on these tee boxes, you can't see this water. And so we want to make sure that uh, we can grade it, which means change the elevation and expand it slightly so that you'll be able to see exactly where that hazard starts and begins. The corner of the lake actually gets filled. So for those people that just sort of hit it right in that corner, which I know is a lot. That actually gets, that fairway gets much wider right here. And then we have a perimeter berm, right? So the hide all the noise and the visual and, and audio noise that's there. And then notice the, the halfway house gets relocated, right? So it gets moved. And so now what would happen is that you would go, of course, from now would be your curtain, would be the proposed ninth. You stop at the halfway house and then you go over to 10. If you needed to stop there, you know, it's just right, you know, we'd have a path that would go right over to your proposed two T's. So everything is very convenient. We've also allowed for a number of parking spaces that are there. So just as you, some of you use it right now, if you want to stop in for a drink or a snack or something, when you're driving to the neighborhood, you can park and do that. Uh, if people are walking the dog or going for a bike ride, again, that's a community asset as well, not just, not just for the golf. Okay, I'm gonna do the back nine. <laughs> Bear with me. I hope you're finding this interesting, though. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so here's hole existing hole number two, right? Wrapping around. Yeah, that's the part five. Let's see what happens here. Right. By the way, people will ask about what's the difference between this blue and this blue, right? So if you see the white hatching, that's your existing lake size, right? Okay. So in this case, yeah. So in this case, we're expanding. In this case, we're expanding the lake that's here. Same thing here, we get this expanded. Now I'm gonna point out something. So for example, on number two, I told you that, you know, about the, the increase in the width of the fairways. You see the red dotted line here, this is the left edge of your fairway, and here's the right edge of your fairway. This fairway is double the width of what you actually play right now. So, because people tend to focus and they go, ooh, look at all that blue. And then I go, yeah, but ooh, look at all the green. <laughs> so it's a balance, right? We're always looking for the balance. All right. The other thing too is that again, everything is so you know here has to be so driven by your community inside. So these folks, anybody live here by chance? Nobody in the room. So if you ever really pay attention to the view that these homes have here, they're at the back of big grass mounds. They can't see anything of the golf. So you know, we would actually lower those mounds so they would have a, a view of this beautiful green setting right now on this lake. <laughs> Next tall has some interesting uh, uh, issues with it as well. So you know, one of which is that the canal is much bigger at this point. So we can't pipe that canal uh, you know, easily or financially. 
but now you have better players, right, who can, can certainly reach that canal. So, and you can't see it, so that's a hidden water hazard. And again, you, you think you hit a good shot and if it's a dry day and the ball rolls and then you're like, oh, you know, I just hit a great shot. Yep, and they get penalized. But then of course, these tees are all stacked together. And so other folks have a tough time to get over it in two, right? So you, you sort of get the double whammy again. So how do you, how do you fix that? So here's the before and the after. So for the better players in the championship, they actually now have a shot here. This is called a cape hole. And what I mean by cape hole is that you look at the center line here. So you can play it more conservative to here or play it here or here or here or here. Of course, the longer that you have, the, you know, the, the, the bigger the carries. But we've also then taken a bunch of the tees and we've moved them forward so that you'd be able to get closer to the canal with a better chance of getting over it in two. Okay. The lake that's here is gone. Notice that. So we've moved the green away from the homes. And the lake there that's gone. Oh yeah. Now I'm going to show you uh, an instance uh, from a different golf course where earthwork-wise, at least, how this would sort of appear. So this is unique at Quail, right? So think about it. You have one, two, three, four, five golf holes that all conglomerate together. You really don't have that any other place on the North Golf Course where that many holes come together. That's an area where Dana and Patrick and I look. And we could actually start to raise that elevation up and then create different uphill and downhill shots because they're all coming together. So this hole would actually play uphill, the par three plays downhill, the next tee shot would play slightly downhill, the approach into this green would play uphill, and then these, this tee shot would play downhill. So again, we're starting to create all this different elevation change. This would be one of the higher points uh, on the property. Now, again, if you're sandwiched in between uh, these community aspects, you never want to block somebody's view. However, in this case, oh, by the way, this is not your community. You know, that would be nice to have out of sight and out of mind. And so everything that's here, you're looking into the, what we call amphitheater green setting. If you don't know what I mean by that, all right, you're going to have some of the better examples coming up at Augusta National, right? So think when you're watching the 18th hole and the players are going up that hill, and then you think about all the thousands of patrons that are on the hillside behind the 18th green. That's what we call an amphitheater green set. It's like when you go to a music concert or a play, right? So the green would be like where the band would be and then the patrons, right? So that's the background. That's why we call it an amphitheater green set. So anybody who lives along this area right here, you're just going to be looking up into that green setting into this beautiful amphitheater green setting with you know garden landscaping all back behind it. Par three, and we met with both sides of homeowners. And so there were a bunch of iterations of this. Um, but again, you've got the lake, you know, the bunker, the timber uh, wall that's here, and then the tree that everybody loves to hate. Oh. Right. You know, so, my, I have a plaque there. You have a plaque there? <laughs> the person who hit it the most? Yeah. I'll look it there. I would do the same thing. So the T's get bigger as you're moving forward. Again, they're moving to the left, and that's because of. The bulk of the fairway and the bailout areas to the left, forward tees are here. They'd be able to put the ball into the green. Again, uh, backdrop perimeter landscaping. Uh, so that's a, again, nice change. So it's a downhill, would be a downhill, more downhill than it is right now, uh, par three. The long uh, par four, you know, here. So you're playing up to, and what's the road? Boynton Beach Boulevard. Boynton Beach Boulevard. So that's really busy, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a the, man up there, Andy. Oh, go. So notice what happens behind the golf hole here, right? So another perimeter berm landscaping here. So this would actually then wrap all the way down. And so anybody who lives in this community right now, I'm sure that it's really noisy with that road traffic. So we would actually then, as part of the golf project, continue the berm down and landscape it. So it would be a lot quieter for those folks who live there. Of course, now you're playing uphill into this tee shot and stop at the comfort station. And then guess what? The next tee shot plays downhill. Okay. Uh, well, what kind of elevation on that? Well, part of it will be you know going through in the permitting process. But again, the berm would be anywhere from 8 to 20 feet high. And that's what we're looking at. So you could have, you might have even 20 foot downhill tee shots, depending upon what tee you play. Because I find, you know, that's number four, right? It's current number four. Uh, part five. Well, I'm, I'm, I got a question on turn number four. Can we go back to that for a second? I, we're going to do questions at the end, sir. Okay. 
Okay, so here's this is the par five playing down, and then again, this is remember, you know, I know that you can hit it just to the right of the green, and the ball hits here, and then it kicks right out of bounds. So we want to eliminate all of that. So this next stretch of holes that happen here would have that perimeter berm all the way down the right hand side. So this would become it becomes more containment golf, right? So much more playable. Right. And then you're getting into the home stretch. Remember that this pond goes away, right? So you see the pond that's here now. So this is the apex of the five golf holes come together, right? So this would be the highest point right here, downhill tee shot. Again, point out, this is your current fairway bunker. So the fairway, the, the fairway actually goes, it's much, much wider than you're playing right now. This would play downhill all the way. The green would be very low in elevation. And then you would be able to see, look across the lake there. That's a long part for us. Okay. Now, this is now your current eighth hole, which would be <coughs> yeah. your 16th hole, right? So a lot of people hit it in that bunker, yeah. not better players, because better players can hit it past that easily. And then the other thing that happens is that that corner of the pond, right? So a lot of people can't quite get to the green in two. They hit it right in that corner of the pond there. Mm -hmm. Or if you're trying to avoid the pond and you hit it right to here and the ball then rolls and trickles out of bounds or into the jungle. I can't imagine how many thousands of golf balls are in there. I wouldn't get mine either. <coughs> All right, so look what happens here. All right, so look at the bunker. Look at the fairway bunker. That's actually part of the fairway now. Jason, did you raise the elevation on that on the left side of that by the by the uh, by the green? No, you'll see we actually have before and after images of both of these holes. Okay. I mean, that hole you know, like slopes to the left. It slopes to the left to the, the, the green. Fairway comes down. Right, yeah. the fairway would come down. So the tees would still be elevated. It would be playing downhill. The fairway would actually be lowered in elevation. We'll show you what that looks like uh, yeah. actually. Of course, we'll see the, the berm and what this right side looks like to enhance the playability of it and then creating a nice backdrop to the green there. Again, we have a before and after image of this hole. And then you're that's not not pitched hard to the left. Not pitched. Yeah, hard. that's what I'm asking. Yes. No, you'll see that that fairway's like that now. Yeah, you'll see an after a proposed image. Of course, in the current uh, ninth, which would be your proposed 17th, and we're trying to build this big crescendo to the end of the round. Sorry, Andy. Uh, and so here's the, that's the after, so the before. Now, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, we talk to people about when they get into that waste bunker and they said it's like purgatory. I got to, you know, wait a couple of shots before I can get to my final destination. But when you really look at it, a lot of people really avoid it and hit out to the right. So, uh, you know, again, we're, that's, we're using this GPS data tracker because we can see where people hit it. All right. And then, so, and then we have an after image of what this would look like. Again, now the way that this actually would get built, this perimeter berm goes down the right, that slope of that fairway actually is canted. So you wouldn't even have to take on the water. You could just hit it shorter of the green and it would kick, or excuse me, shorter of the green into the fairway and kick onto the green. Again, it's one of those things you have to, you know, you learn about the ground slopes. Now the 18th hole is when Dana and I went through this, you know, you typically will like end up at some big crescendo, maybe it's backdrop at the clubhouse. And so you're thinking Quail Ridge, you know, here we go. And then we finish on 18th and I'm like, no, oh, we just finished right to the edge of the tees on number one. And I'm like, eh, it's a little anticlimactic. So of course we're sandwiched in between the South golf course, you know, and the residences. So it's not like we can move the golf hole, but you know, we kept thinking about, all right, how can we make this really, really, you know, uh, good and better. So, Here's the, the after. You notice what we did is that we took the lake and then we wrapped it around. So you've got a back right Sunday pin position. Still, you can run the ball on 60 or 70% of the green that's there. The fairway is significantly wider, right? So more playable. So look at the two bunkers, right? They're actually in the proposed fairway now. And again, this is how we use that, that tracker technology because we know that those bunkers needed to get pushed forward that way. And then the other thing is, is that for the folks who uh, live in this community that use that path system that's there, so the path would still remain, but then we would actually build a nice timber walk bridge that you could use for walking your bikes. So you can imagine now playing this golf hole, you'd be able, you don't see any water right now, right? So when you're playing 18, you don't see water at all. So you would have this long view out through the lake that's here, then with the beautiful arched timber bridge so that, that would go back behind that it. That green would come way down, so it opens up the water. Yeah. So it really makes for a much more spectacular finish to the golf. <laughs> now the... The North Project also uh, takes on the practice facilities too, right? So I'm gonna show you that. 
again, here's the practice range tee and the putting green and the short game area. So this is as it exists, right? And then here's the proposed in particular, watch the tee. Much more room. Right, so you have 35,000 square feet right now. That's how big it is. It's going to 52,000 square feet. You know, we can't pick the range up and move it someplace else. You don't have that kind of space, but you think about how beat up this can get during the season. And so you'll be able to move it, you know, Dan and, and Chris can move the, the markers around a lot better, keep you on the grass a lot longer, better condition. The other thing is that it's wider too. So when you get that big crush, you know, and everybody wants to get up there at one time, you'll be able to put more people on it uh, at a single time. There is room, you know, to do a performance center if you wanted to do that. Uh, here's the South Kern house uh, that Brian and his staff have put in, about a 5,000 square foot putting green so that you can, you know, uh, putt before you tee off on one south. And then plus they can use it, uh, you guys can use it uh, to take to alleviate some of the pressure off of your main putting green. Uh, of course, the uh, starters pavilion here uh, gets slid over. So this is just as Brian showed you. We added some more park parking so you can pull right next to it rather than just, you know, the, the mad and everybody just parks wherever they want right now. Uh, we added a cart path and parking that stretches down this side of the short game area. So if you wanted to get back and use the back corner over here, you don't have to uh, park where everybody's trying to drive through and then have that long walk. You can drive around and park. And then the short game area is split in two different styles, right? So one half of it is South Course style with the dome greens and the small pot bunkers. The other half of them would be in the style of the North Golf Course. So you can practice both, both varieties. The other piece to this then is that we wanted to limit the distance that people hit shots. And Dan said right now, he goes, you got people in there hitting 50 and 60 yard lob shots. And he says, it's too dangerous. So what we did is that we limited it by you know, placement of the, the greens and the fairways here to about 20 yards max. And then everybody else who wants to play and practice those longer shots would go to the range tee. And then we have what we call wedge greens. So those are in increments of 10 yards and have markers. So you can hit you know, your approach wedges and lob wedges and those types of things. So the interior of the range then would be recreated, meaning that we would change the surface so that you can see the target greens and everything in between. Now, right now you're just hitting shots and they just sort of land into oblivion and you don't know. That's right. And so we would correct that. And then the other aspect too is that you could then shut down the range, pick the range, and then turn it into an evening wine and dine, you know, or do golf, you know, low golf, or just you know more uh, social programming in the evenings. Again, just another expanded opportunity. Okay, Andy, I'm gonna. I'm sorry. Practice area is only one way. No, so the North Range uh, T would yeah. still remain. So that's as is. And then, uh, you know, what we know that that's a, you know, can be a dangerous situation. So depending upon weather conditions, when you're using the back half of this new T, you know, that would be open. If we're always, always on the forward T, then they might have to close that on you know, a couple of days. Uh, thanks. And then we do have plans in the budget for 265 feet length of, of new synthetic T as well. Right, I'll let you flip back over here. So we've got some before and after images now, uh, vertical images. I think that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Heck, we didn't even get to the real fun stuff. Like yeah, really, what it looks like. <laughs> oh yes, sir. Yes, it is. So here's some of the, we call these precedent images. Okay, so anybody play uh, our course called Calusa Pines over in Naples by chance? So, uh, you know, years ago, the owner of this facility came and he visited our firm up in Columbus, you know, which is where we were based. And he said, you know what? He goes, what can you guys do different in Florida that hasn't been done before? 4,000 some odd golf courses in Florida. You know, that's a pretty big charge there, you know, to do. And the first question we had when we looked at him, we said, well, it depends. What's your budget? Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said, well, he goes, don't worry about budget for the moment. He goes, I just want to know how creative you guys are. So what we did here, this is the first project of its kind uh, in Florida, was that it was a fairly large earth moving project. But this point right here is the highest point in all of Collier County on the golf course. It's roughly 59 feet above sea level. It's about 45 feet of fill. I mean, it's a lot but you can never tell it because of the way that it was re-landscaped with all native species. And I'll show you some sort of ground level images of this, but look what happens, right? So you have one, 
there's a par three here that's two, three, four, five. In this case, there's six holes that actually come to one location. <laughs> there's no homes on this property, right? So we have the space to do that. But remember the one area that I told you about, uh, you know, that would be like current three playing into that apex where all those holes come together. So you can create this type. This would be the apex in between those holes. This hole plays uphill. You're going to see a moment in a moment with this hole. It's like this hole plays downhill, downhill. This hole starts to play uphill, right? So you're starting to get that elevation change. So this is one of the holes. Now this is sort of that amphitheater green setting. Now you would not have waste bunkers, obviously. You know, but you'll notice that here's a landscaped ridge that wraps all the way around. It almost looks like you're in North Carolina. And you can see the bank of the green that's here. So you can avoid these bunkers and you can hit it in this location here and just feed the ball onto the green, right? So this is how, you know, the, some of these landscaped ridges then ultimately would get built. Obviously we would have oak trees and maybe some palmettos and pine trees, right? So here's a different view of one of the holes, right? So you can imagine where the pin is on this photograph or even over here. If you're a highly skilled golfer, you can try and challenge the bunker in the water. You know, but everybody else, you know, what they want to care about is they can hit it right in the air and let the ball feed onto the green. If you happen to hit a really bad shot, it hits here and guess what? Kicks back into the hole. This is how that whole stretch of perimeter worming works, right? So right now, as you're finishing, you know, you're coming down seven and eight, you hit it to the right and the ball kicks out of bounds. That would not be the case anymore. Now it would hit here and then kick back into play. A lot more fun, a lot more playable, a lot more enjoyable. The other thing that we do then is that in this case, we've used the cart path that's well hidden here, but we have, you'll notice there's this dip in the cart path. There's actually is a drain right there. So we pick up the water and then we take it so we can replenish the lakes. Uh, and then also what that does is that, that keeps your fairway and play areas drier. Okay. Here's a ground view of one of the holes. So this is be somewhat similar, okay? I'm gonna show you a, a true before and after of hole, your existing hole eight. But think about this hole, right? As if you were looking back on the proposed eight hole that I just showed you, right? Here at Calusa, we have a waste bunker. What would you have? Think about water, exactly. So imagine that you were standing looking back on the proposed eight hole and this was the lake over here. Here's your landscaped ridge, right? On the other side of the ridge would be the out parcels of homes, right? You would never see them. And then you would have this type of a bank that's here. So instead of hitting here and going, I would be, you would hit the bank and we kick back into the line of play. Now, some people, you know, I've always wondered, and they're like, well, can we build the golf and then do the berm later? You have to be done together. And the reason is, is that to get the fill to build this, we have to generate by lowering, for example, the eight fairway that generates the fill material. The other thing is, is that notice then the contours. And when I say that, these are the ridges and the valleys that get blended in off of that. So artistically, everybody wants, you know, nice rolling topography. Jason and Dana get rid of our flat golf course. This is how you do it. So not only would you have a downhill tee shot, but then look at the contouring in the fairway. Get side hill, downhill, uphill lies, right? That's all part of the fun of golf. This is the par three that plays downhill. So when they talk about having some of your par threes play downhill, now this is about 30 feet. Yours would be anywhere from, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet. But imagine having that at the north course at Quail. Right. And again, this is all built. This is all this landscaping is built and all the contouring. So look how you know, pretty that is. Another example of uh, one of the holes, this plays slightly downhill. Again, there's drainage here and here and here. You know, plenty of room to bail out. Again, kicker slopes, eating balls on the fairways, not the domes. Right. This is an instance where you know that this is a whole length of the fairway where they're separating the practice range. This is a different type of landscaping, but you know, playing into an amphitheater green setting with the landscape berm that goes all behind it. It's all created. Another instance, you know, so this was a really busy road that went through here, and you'd see all the, the box trucks and all the rest of it, you know, but now you're just playing up, and this is the landscape ridge. So imagine like on your current fourth hole where we talked about having a landscape ridge, you know, playing up to that. It looks something similar like this backdrop. All right, I'm gonna ask Andy to do, this is the last part of the golf. Double click on it. Okay, a couple of before and after uh, renditions. You just gotta share it with everybody in Zoom. Land. That's a new uh, term I've coined now, by the way, Zoom land. Yeah.
Okay. So this is the, the, the drivable, uh, your current 14th hole, which would be your proposed sixth, right? So Christopher uh, took these photographs about three weeks ago. Of course, you know, your beautiful pond that's here right now. Uh, I'm joking, by the way, just because look at all the banks. <laughs> that's the parcel that's being developed. Of course, you see the roof lines that are in the background over here, the power poles, the wires. And then of course you have all of the noise of the traffic. So this is, remember I said that this hole would play roughly 20 feet of fill. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> that's really nice. So the lakes go away. Which hole is it? That would be current your 14. Your current 14. 14. So now keep in mind, you know, it's shorter. The proposed is shorter. So it's only 200 yards from the forward tee, 223. You know, so look at the distances. Even though it looks scary, it's 263 yards. I mean, it's, you know, for me, I could actually play that hole with two seven irons. I probably should play with two seven irons. As golf course architects, what we like to do is have you guys think that you're Tiger Woods, you know, and so, I mean, you know, people should be playing out here and you've got this kicker slope and a whole landscape berm, you know, and you can hit it here with then just, I mean, you could really, you could put it on in the green if you were smart, but I know what we, you know, we like to trick you guys. So we want you to play the heroic shot and try and hit a three wood or a drive or someplace up here. And then once in a while you make a two and, you know, sometimes you make a three and you're feeling really good. And the next time you get there, you hit a bad shot and you make a six and you go, how did I just do that? And we laugh like a Cheshire cat. But you know, again, so but power poles, roof lines, everything out of sight, out of mind. Beautiful. So then here's the 12. So this is the this gentleman asked about. Do you live on this hole? Number four. Bro. This is four. This is the new 12. This is four. So where do you live? Left or right? Of I don't live there. No, oh, don't you don't live there. there. Okay. <laughs> She does on the left. Sorry, it's not, it's not four I was asking about. I apologize. I was asking about five. Uh, ah, okay. The next one. okay. I'm on it. You're on it. Okay. Yeah. So here's the. <laughs> Lovely. Is that okay? Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So tees are going forward and then they move to the left. Again, if you're playing for a couple of tees, you know, you can hit a hit a shot over here. Big bailout area, you know, another kicker slope background, right? So even if I don't know where you live over here, but you know, that the, the road traffic then should be buffered as well. It should be a little quieter for you. A couple of things I want to point out, particularly about the lake systems that are here. So I don't sure how many people understand why your lakes are within the golf course. They're not there because of the golf. They're there for stormwater management for the community. So it happens that every time that it rains, it, your street system and your gutters, you know, it, it collects all of that water. And prior to the golf, prior to the golf and the community being built, right? So some engineer went through and they said, okay, on the natural native terrain when it rained. The water would leave the site at a certain rate after a big rainstorm. When sites get developed in Florida, so they have to model that. And then once it gets developed, because of course water runs off of the rooftops and the streets and things a lot quicker, the, that site, the entire totality of that site is not allowed to get rid of the water any faster than prior to the development. Well, water runs off of streets a heck of a lot faster than it runs off of woods and turf, right? So where is, what, what do you do with the water then? So all the water gets collected into your street systems and your uh, and the houses and all the rest of it. And that's where the water ends up because it goes into the golf course lakes, right? The golf course is just the receptor of everything in the development, right? Now what's happened over time is because of, you know, the, the community is almost 50 years old or at least the, you know, certain parts of it is that these were dug much deeper. So we've asked engineers to go through and actually tell us how deep the lakes are on average. You know, they, they vary from pond to pond, but on average, they're only about four feet deep now. I promise you that they weren't dug just four feet deep, you know, when they were originally built. So what happens is that every time that it rains, it's picking up grit from the roads, you know, roof tiles in some cases, even the water quality of it. You know, it's not the golf course isn't really what, what drives the water quality of those lakes. What happens is that every time you've got an oil leak from your car or a transmission leak or spray your windshield wiper fluid, all of that ends up on the road systems and it ends up in the lakes. So as part of the solution when we build, rebuild the golf course is that we're going to deepen as many of the lakes back as we can. You know, that fill material will go to help with the landscape berming, but we're gonna try and restore the depth of those. And then we also end up doing a lot of, and this becomes part of the environmental you know, plan, 
is that we do a lot of aquatics or you'll see uh, terms called littoral shelf planting. That's wetland planting, probably says something here on the back top right. So from a landscape perspective, you know, visual aesthetic perspective, we want to pick out plant material that's got color and texture and height, you know, just as you have in your home, you know, gardens or yards. So we want to add, you know, that, you know, that to the, to the overall ambiance of that hole or any of the lake systems, but they also do a good job of filtering out the nutrients. You know, your landscaper comes by and puts down fertilizer on your yard and it rains the next day, guess where it goes, right? So now there's a common fallacy. You've got Chris and his staff, they're watching the weather all the time, right? So he wouldn't do that. These guys get paid by putting it down on your yard. So they want to get it down no matter what the weather is going to be. So again, that water quality is really being controlled more by you and your landscapers than it is by the golf. But we can do a better job of cleansing the water. Uh, it'll depend pond by pond and how access, I mean, we're going to get them as deep as we can. So here's, um, this is your current eighth hole, okay? So this is just your proposed 16th. So this is a current eighth. Okay, so I'm going to point out a few things. So here's the bunker, right? So and that blocks the view of the water. You can't see it. Of course, you've got a hard slope on this right-hand side over here yeah. of the or left edge of the fairway, but right of the pond. <clears throat> This is a corner that a lot of people, you know, end up rolling their ball into. And a lot of that's because they're worried about hitting it over to here, right, and out. So, and then, of course, you still see some of the background noise that's over here. And I don't even know what that is, power pole or maybe a cell phone tower. All right, but look at the after. Look where the bunker is. Look what happens. <laughs> oh, beauty. Okay, so the fairway actually gets considerably wider here, right? So for the bulk of players, so that bunker goes away. That's much, much wider. Corner of the pond gets filled in. Now there's a new bunker for better players, and this is where they would typically hit it, right? So they're, we're, they're, we're trying to give them things to think about in this area. Everybody else is hitting here, and then they're trying to get it to the green, but you got more room here. But that whole fairway then gets lowered. So what we look at, we call your, so the elevation of your current fairways and then your water control elevation of many of your ponds is pretty significant. Yeah. So if we can lower some of the fairways in areas, right, that's going to be some of the fill material for the perimeter berm. And then you can see, you know, we have really heroic, you know, pin location. You can imagine on a given day, the pin's way over here. You know, that's exciting. Here's intermediate, tough. You know, if you don't reach the pin, you're in a bunker, not in water, but you're in a bunker. Then you've got roughly half of the green that you can, again, roll the ball onto. <laughs> And if you're really worried about it, you can hit it to the right. But look what happens now. Before there was a big old hedge and the ball would kick yeah. the OB, but now you've got a slope. It's here and then the ball rolls back down, right? And that would be like that all the way down the golf hole. And then you see the backdrop over here, right? So everything gets screened out. All right, last but not least, I told you we're gonna build drama. This is your current night, right? So the waste bunker. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you've got the, the road, roadway over to the right, the canal and the power poles, and then the road in the background over here. So you're coming around the bend, and you've got some guests here. Oh, geez, what a wow. difference. So again, oh the Toro shelf planting, berm that would wrap all the way down the right-hand side. Again, I mean, it's you can have the pin that's there, but you can also hit it. Notice that that fairway is slanted, right? So you can hit it to here and let the ball feed onto the front of the green. Again, that's one of those things that you're hoping that maybe your, your opponent's going first. <laughs> and you just tees over to the right, you know, so there's no force carry for any of the four key players. So that becomes very nice. Amazing. Looks nice, but isolated. That's more difficult. That, that would be more difficult. But uh, depends. Not a lot of people hit it into that bunker. I'm not saying nobody, but a lot of people, you know, they avoid it. So, so is the width of the fairway, the new fairway, that's not the same close yep. to the tee as it is now? Pretty much. So let's put that into perspective. No, it doesn't look like it. I know. <laughs> it's water. It's water. Yeah, what I'm saying it's about water. About the same length. Yeah, it's the same length hole. I'm not about the length. I'm talking about the width. Yeah, your your play area up to the right or short. Yeah, it's the same. It's not getting any. It's not 
your bailout area to the right is not getting, it's actually easier because you would have, again, you've got, you've got a backstop to the right and behind the hole. You got a ball. You can hit it to the right all you want. Right now, you can hit it into the halfway house over there, right? And the ball goes into all that stuff now. It would just hit a bank and kick back down into play. So you can hit it to the right all you want, and you're not going to be penalized. And there's no, you know, there's Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Bill because obviously all of these things cost money. <laughs> He's going to run through. One, one last question. <laughs> when would you start this project? Mm, we're going to go through that after Bill's part to that. Yep. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. And I promise I won't take as long as both of these guys. So <laughs> that's because your part's not as fun. <laughs> that's exactly right. I was, I was just going to start by saying, you know, I've had to follow all the pretty pictures nine times now. So uh, uh, kind of over it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so my part of this today is just to walk you through the financial model. And first is the cost on each project. And then we're going to go from the cost to how we think we can pay for it uh, on a big level. And then we'll step down to what that means in a potential assessment on overall. And then we'll get down to what it means for you individually, which is really what you're interested in, right? Uh, and, and then we'll wrap it up with some final thoughts. So Andy, would you click me one more time? Vanna White's moved on me, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that did be my stick for a long time. Oh, it's, it's there. <laughs> Try not. Thank you. Uh, so first we're gonna start with the uh, Southgate and Guard House. And, uh, uh, we spent a lot of time with Peacock and Lewis on this, and uh, they provided us with our initial preliminary cost estimate. Uh, in addition to that, we asked them to go to, BA, go, to go out to a couple of contractors. They went out to BSA and Mao, two local contractors. Uh, BSA was the company that built the building that we're in today. They also built the maintenance, community maintenance facility down there. So. We have a good track record with BSA and there's a lot of trust there with, with that company. Uh, and so their numbers came back almost identical to Peacock and Lewis's. We also asked WGI or land planners to give us an estimate on the hardscape and landscape. Hardscape meaning all the roads that come in, the curbing that goes with it, the pavers that goes with it, the monument signs, stuff like that. Their number came in almost identical to Peacock and Lewis's as well. Then we went and met with uh, Palm Beach County because you have to go to Palm Beach County zoning and ask for a road cut for that new road coming in, mm -hmm. right? So uh, when we went there, they said, well, it's a really nice looking plan and it seems like it would work and it seems like it'd be a lot safer, but we have an issue with the dual municipality issue. So there's four land parcels up there, separate tax parcels. We own them all. They're all Quail Ridge Property Owners Association. Two of them are physically located in the village of Gall. Two of them are physically located in unincorporated Palm Beach County. And so they said, well, yes, we provide the curb cut, but we could not approve a project going across another municipality's property, meaning village of Gall. And so they suggested we go talk with village of Gall about the possibility of de-annexing those two parcels from village of Gall and letting them annex them into Palm Beach County. I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Berman and I went over about three weeks ago, met with the mayor and the city manager over there, and much to our surprise, they were very open to it. Uh, and, and they were open to it, uh, I think, mainly because they understand our safety issue. They're very appreciative that we're about to get the stoplight put up. They think it's going to help with traffic on, on Gulf Road out there. Uh, and then they asked us for our help because they want to get all of the trees out there classified by the National Historical Preservation Society so that the county couldn't come along at some time and take all those down and four lane that road. And we said we'd absolutely be a partner with them. 
and, and try to work through that with them. So uh, all I can tell you about this one is it's going to be a very complex project. It's probably going to take longer than the uh, tennis facility and longer than the golf just because of the complexity of de-annexing and annexing and the zoning and everything that's going to be required uh, to get through it. Uh, from a placeholder standpoint, we're using a number of 1.95 million for this project. And that includes a little over $200,000 in contingency. Here's what that looks like to you. Uh, total construction price for the building is about $711,000, about $500,000 for site work and landscaping. Again, that's split. Uh, most of that is the hardscape work, the roads, the curbing. Uh, the pavers, et cetera, and then the landscaping. General conditions, demolishing the building that's there now, the builder's overhead and profit gets you to about a million five. And then we would have to move all the equipment, the camera equipment around out there with, with part of that. Soft costs is professional fees, architects, engineers, et cetera. And then permit cost runs about 4% of the project. And then we're carrying a little better than a 12% contingency or construction related uh, escalations there to get you to the 1.95 million. So that's, uh, that's the gatehouse project. Moving over to the tennis, uh, very similar. Uh, Peacock and Lewis provided us with the initial estimates uh, and then BSA came on site and they did a very thorough on site review for us. One of the things that uh, those tennis players in the room know that over the last five or six years, We've been redoing two tennis courts a year, taking them from above ground irrigation to subsurface irrigation. Well, the courts that are right directly across the, from the uh, tennis facility and adjacent to the road are, the, are some of the last ones that we've reserved to be done because we thought if we were ever able to do this, that would be the way you would access the site. You would take those courts that ultimately would be redone You'd access the site that way, demolish the building, that would become the construction site. When the building's done and it moves off, then you redo those tennis courts. And so they spent a lot of time with us trying to understand all of that. Uh, and then they gave us their preliminary pricing based on the floor plan. Uh, we now have the renderings, so we'll get those to them and make sure that we're still in the same ballpark. Uh, and then we added a placeholder for the landscaping around it. We also added a placeholder for the FF and E furniture fixtures and equipment uh, in the IT equipment in that building. Uh, the professional fees run roughly that same 10% of the job cost. Uh, and then we've got, we're carrying a 10% builder's contingency and another 5% owner's contingency in this project or 711,000. So the number that we're using for this building is $5.5 million. Here's what that looks like. Upper lower levels, you heard uh, Brian Idle speak earlier. Uh, it really is a room for room replacement of what's there now with the exception of the covered space. The covered space right now only is about on the front half of that building is the only two story part. Now this would be 360 all the way around the outdoor covered space that would be added. Cost of building the building is about 3.7. <coughs> Uh, then we've got FF and E of about 450,000 professional fees, permits, get to the 4.7, and then we're carrying 711,000 uh, in contingencies to get to the $5.5 million number. Uh, North Course uh, took a little more work for us to get to a, a hard number, and I'll, I'll describe why, but uh, Jason and his team gave us a 43-44 line uh, preliminary uh, cost estimate budget for that uh, that had everything from uh, drainage to irrigation to sod to sprigs to earth moving to uh, chipping and burying of the current perimeter line and, and everything that goes with that. They also gave it to us on a uh, high and low situation. Uh, so they, they took a current project that is three weeks into its project right now over at Bel Air, just outside of Tampa. And he used that as our low pricing. So those are current known numbers right now on all those items I talked about, whether it's earth moving or cost of sand or cost of rock or cost of drainage pipe or any of that. And then he gave us a high number based on escalating costs for a year from now. Uh, 
Uh, and so then we talked about several items that we knew probably were going to have to be on the high side. And I'll just give you one example of that. Uh, when you grass a golf course, you have two ways to be able to grass a golf course. You either use sod or you use sprick. We always put a ring of sod around the tee boxes, a ring of sod around the greens, a ring of sod around the bunker faces, uh, and then a ring of sod around all of the drainage basins so that you don't have all the wash going into it. And then you typically sprig everything else. Sprigging is a lot less expensive than siding. But because we have so much earthwork and berm work here on the Bel Air project in his budget, I think you were carrying 10 acres of sod. For this budget, we're carrying 20 acres of sod. So we're carrying twice as much. So we've tried to be very careful as we walk through that to make sure that uh, we, were, we were looking at this in the right way. We also got high and low quotes on our irrigation project and engineering. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time with Jason, uh, really trying to understand the perimeter berming and the internal berming. Uh, so we understood what part of that was really associated with the golf course and what part of that might be associated with the safety and security and re replacement of the perimeter. And here's what we came to. Out of all the berming that he showed you in his pretty pictures today, about 80% of that is around the whole perimeter. Uh, the last 20% of it is kind of some of that internal berming that he showed you in a few places. And so in order to get to his number, we took the apex of the hill and anything going on the downhill side, going toward what would be a new fence line, we moved that out of the cost of the golf course over into the perimeter budget. But anything coming back toward the golf course side, cart paths, landscaping, irrigation, grassing is all included in the golf course side. So that's how we had to work through this to get to those numbers. Uh, as this plan uh, fleshes itself out, it'll, it'll give us a 19 page estimate. It's that same 44 lines, but on a whole by whole basis, uh, that'll be forthcoming for us. For model purposes for the golf course, we're using a number of $12 million. Uh, and that includes roughly 655,000 or just over a 5% contingency. Here's how we get to that number. As I told you, the low side over at Bel Air uh, is in the 83 number. The high side was the 12.5. We took a blend of that. We took an average blend in the middle and then added those high items like the grass items or any other known items that we knew had to be high end. Uh, and then we added architect fees, irrigation, engineers, builders risk insurance. And you might remember when we did the South course, you have the growing costs. So when the builder, when the contractor puts the grass down, as soon as it goes down, it's our responsibility <coughs> to begin cutting it, fertilizing it, growing it in. And so we have the cost of the labor and the fertilization and stuff like that. So, so that number is in that budget as well. So that gets us uh, with the contingency back to 12 million. The final piece is uh, to do with the perimeter. Uh, and, and so again, we spent some time talking with Jason about this and we've talked about uh, how we separated out the perimeter berming. We then had to add a line item for fencing uh, all the way around the property because all of our fencing is at the end of its useful life. Uh, we also added additional money for landscaping materials. You might say, why? Well, his budget carries the landscaping for the berms. But if on this side of the berm, you end up putting a fence line down there, and think about Canuth Road if you've ever been down there. If all you had was a clear see-through fence and you were looking over to a berm that was landscaped out, that might look fairly appealing for somebody to come over that fence, where if you have that fence there and you've got some planning along that fence line, then it's going to be less appealing for somebody to come over. But because we'll have the berm that will hide everything, you can use smaller landscape product and, and let it grow over time. So we've carried a, a number for that. And then we've also carried some contingency. Then we, we recognize there were several items that needed to be pulled out of his budget because they weren't related at all to the golf course, but it's important for us to talk about. First one is community drainage work. So when you start you heard him talk about how all the lakes are tied together for the street drainage and everything else coming off the roads and off your homes 
and going through the golf course. Well, they're gonna be replacing all the drainage on the golf course, but a lot of this was street connections back to the golf course. Well, if it's a street connection, that doesn't belong in the cost of the golf course. And so we carry a $250,000 budget every year to replace drainage in this community. And if you live in Partridge, you know we've been over there doing some work this year. If you're over by Royal Turn, you know that we've had the front of that dug up over there doing some work this year. And so we would just take care of that through our regular CapEx budget over the next couple of years for, for the street connection work. Uh, the next one is the community irrigation main line. When we did the south course, we were able to repurpose the main line on the south course uh, and, and not have the expense of that. It saved us about a half a million dollars. On the north course, we're not gonna be so lucky. The reason we're not so lucky is first, building the lakes to create the berm, we get into a lot of the main line that's already there. The other part of it is a lot of the main line runs right where the berm is, the berming is going to go. And so if the main line is about six feet deep right now, and Jason comes along and puts 20 feet of dirt on top of it, and then you have a 40 year old main line that breaks. Now we're gonna have a big dig out there on a brand new golf course trying to get that far down to a hole. So it just makes sense for us to go ahead and bite the bullet and do a new main line for the POA uh, on, on that end. And that's included in the community irrigation budget. So we're trying to be very transparent in, in how we're approaching all of this. And then the last part is the lake bridge connecting Blue Heron because so many of you ride your bikes or walk or come to, come to the club by coming through Blue Heron it doesn't have anything to do with the golf course. So we took the cost of that footbridge uh, there that's going to connect Blue Heron back to the club out of the cost of the golf course. And we put that in our regular CapEx. We spend about 1.3 to $1.6 million a year in ongoing CapEx, very easy for us to absorb that there. So here's what this looks like. So the, the portion of the golf course berming and safety and security for the perimeter that comes out is about $1.1 million. We added a placeholder of a half a million dollars for the fencing, uh, landscaping materials, another 300, and then contingency of 111 to get us back to a $2 million number. And then as I talked about, all this would come out of these other budgets and so would not be included as part of any type of vote because that would all just be handled uh, and as to what we're already doing. So if you're trying to do the math, uh, as you're jotting this down, we've done it for you. Uh, North course renovation, $12 million, tennis pavilion, 5.5, new gatehouse in uh, Southgate area, 1.95, and then the perimeter north of Wilbright, $2 million, totals $21,450,000. And that number includes a $1.7 million total contingency. So that would be our first hedge against any inflation between now and then would be that contingency that we built into every one of these projects. The second hedge would be the difference between the high and low that Jason gave us on exactly what the golf course is costing now and what the golf course may cost a year from now and us using that midpoint number and the high numbers added to it uh, gives us our second hedge. And then I'll talk about a third hedge that we'll have uh, in just a second. So how are we gonna pay for it? Great question. Uh, first of all, we have an open balance in our capital projects fund of $9.2 million. So we're in pretty good shape right there. Now that includes a one-time transfer uh, for, for the financial people in the room you have your designated capital dollars that are designated only to spend on capital. And then you have your working cash for your daily operations, monthly operations. Well, we've got more in our operating cash right now than we need. And so we'll move $1.5 million out to, to get to that $9.2 million number. So that's because we've had several good years of operations. And so we've got some money that we can push toward that. Now, as an organization, we always maintain a minimum balance of a half a million dollars in our designated fund account. So, so we would not be able to, we could use all of that 9.2 with the exception of that half a million dollars 
which really gives us 8.7 to use as a starting point for a project. Over the next two years, new member capital will generate 4.7, almost $4.8 million. New member capital is joining fees for new people joining the club. And so you may say, well, how did you get to that number? Well, when we did this year's budget, we built the budget based on 35 new members because we had two listings at the end of the year and none of us knew how quick we would turn loose uh, capital. And by the way, all this is going to be online either this afternoon or tomorrow. So the whole presentation, Jason's presentation, Brian Idle's presentation, this presentation, and you can spend as much time with it as you like. And we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. But going back to this, we budgeted 35 new members this year because we only had two listings at the beginning of the year. We have two listings right now. We currently have 48 new members so far this year uh, on a budget of 35. We're probably going to end the year around 60, 55 to 60 is, is, is what our thought process is now. Uh, next year, the budget, the, this model is built on 40 because anytime you get into a construction year and you mess and it, it, it gets dirty around here, it tends to slow down real estate sales. But then we go back to using a 20 year average of 45 sales per year. So we think we've been very conservative in how we've approached this because we have a natural turnover of four to five percent of our membership a year through attrition. There would be a be a assessment as part of this project. Uh, and right now it's forecasted as a three year assessment. We'll, we'll again, we'll talk about what that really means for you individually in just a second. But that assessment would generate $2.8 million over the two years of the construction period. And then the third year, the 1.4, it came in and the third year would be used to pay back some short-term debt. Uh, and then we would have another $700,000 of extra money after we pay our regular clubhouse debt service and our handle our community irrigation project. So it would give us about $17 million toward the project. So we come up a little short of that 21 million, right? So what we would do is we would go take a bridge loan for $4.6 million for a two year period of time because the funds will be there. It's just, we're doing so much upfront, um, but the funds will be there. So we do a two year loan and then we would pay it back over two years. And that would be our construction period interest during that period of time, which gets you back to that total of 21,450. Uh, now, from an assessment standpoint, uh, the board and finance committee, long range, all spent quite a bit of time talking about it. Where they settled was to assess the members 20% of the cost of each project. And so what you get to with that is on the golf course, a $12 million golf course project, that means you've got to assess $2.4 million. Where you can only assess the full intermediate primary members. If you're a social member, you're, you're, you don't get charged for golf, which just part of, it's been part of our bylaws forever, which was one of the reasons why we, when we built the new categories, we eliminated the social category, but we've still got 90 plus uh, social members here. Then when we get to the non-golf related common projects, everything outside of that, meaning the tennis, the gatehouse, and the perimeter, everybody shares with that. So there'd be a 20% assessment on that. And so it says assessment to all categories. And then your capital project fund, which is all your new money and your monthly CPF 150 that comes in, all goes into that to pay the balance. And then here's how we would have to take the short-term loan. We'd have to borrow just over 3 million in 2023. We'd borrow about 1.6 in 2024. And then we would immediately pay it back in years 2025 in 2026. So we're able to pay it right back in a very quick way from all of the CPF funds and all of the assessments coming in. So what does it mean to you individually? That's the most important thing. If you're a full member, it means it's $1,000 per year for three years for the golf course. It's $600 per year for three years for all the other projects, tennis, Southgate, and perimeter. So total together, it's $1,600 a year for three years or a total of $4,800. That's the highest one. Intermediate, you see it's 42, primary is 39, 
and social is only 600, so a total of 1,800. So uh, the assessment would be from $600 a year to $1,600 a year, uh, depending on uh, your membership category. Uh, we think that is very reasonable for everything that uh, our, our partners have shared with you today. Uh, just a couple quick other items. The CPF funds 80% of it, but we do anticipate a slight increase by $25 on the CPF, the $150 a month that you pay. Uh, the financial model has that going up $25 effective next fiscal year, which will allow us to absorb some of the inflation that's going on with all of these projects. $120 for members, $85 and it's it should be 85 and under, right? No, over, 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 over. 85 and over, yes, okay. Uh, the quarterly, I, I've given this only nine times. Uh, so uh, the quarterly uh, irrigation assessment would run through 2024 and then that would be done, that 125 a quarter, that would be done. Uh, and then if we're able to generate more than the 40 members next year, more than the 60 members this year, or more than the 45, the following year, any of that new capital that came in would go directly toward paying off that debt early, so that which is exactly what happened with regard to the South course. So would that dropped the assessment. Uh, would not drop the assessment. The twenty percent would stay at the twenty percent. Uh, the bank financing would require us to, to to have it over a two year period of time. Uh, we're recommended it not to exceed $7 million. You may say you, you said you only need 4.6. Well, we view this and, and that's, that's exactly what we're saying we need is 4.6 uh, repaid within two years. The 2.4 would be our third hedge. And I'll, and I'll show you how that works and how it worked on the South course in just a moment. Uh, and then we would continue to defer the accelerated principal payments on the clubhouse debt. Some of you newer members don't have a clue what we're talking about there. So I'd like to walk you through four quick slides that will help you demonstrate, help us demonstrate that to you. When we approved the clubhouse, it was approved for us to borrow $17.5 million. And our original deadline was gonna have us paying it out in 2033. The members then at that time said, we'd like to do that, but if there's any way to pay it off early, please negotiate something for us to be able to pay it off early. And so we negotiated the ability to pay an extra half a million dollars per year uh, to pay it down early. So if we did that, we would pay it off in 2029 instead of 2023. Then along came the South Course project. And at, as part of the South Course project, you voted to waive paying off, making the accelerated payments. You gave... Uh, the board, the ability to create a line of credit for three and a half million dollars. We only borrowed two. So again, it's you always want to make sure that you've got a hedge there in the liquidity that if you get into the project and something crazy happens in the world, that you've got the funds to be able to finish it, which is why you always ask for just a little bit more. And we paid it all back off. So that's where we're at right now. So if you chose not to do any other projects, you could start making as many accelerated payments as you wanted to make on this to get you back within reason. You would just be falling behind on all of your other amenities. And so uh, with a borrowing plan like we put in front of you, uh, this would increase the borrowing over a two year period of time. It'd be repaid over a two year period of time. And if you see what happens with that yellow line, we're still able to pay off all the debt early at the 2029. So as soon as those projects are done, we'll start making start make the making the accelerated payments again, uh, and then we'll pay be able to pay it off early at 2029. So summary: uh, four projects, really three, because I would say to you that the uh, the golf course and the perimeter have to be done together because of the way the perming is so integrated in it. And that's probably the way we will present it to you in a proxy. Uh, the work would occur in 2023 and 2024, just in time for our 50th anniversary in 2024. It'd be a great way as members to celebrate our 50th anniversary, I think. Uh, we, we're starting with nearly $9 million in cash. We believe it's a very reasonable three-year assessment, uh, short-term bridge loan over a couple of years, 
and we'd still be able to pay off the debt early in 2029. And most importantly, the board, the finance committee, and the long range all unanimously uh, approved this project and, and recommend it to the members. So the final thing for me before we get to q and is you're probably interested in how we would handle this through a vote. It is our intention to do this electronically. You got me? Thank you. Uh, it would be our intention to do this electronically. Uh, each project will have a separate vote with the exception of probably the golf and perimeter, probably would do that together. Uh, but also just like all the proxy ballots that you get from all the, uh, from your investments, there would be an option for an all yes or an all no, just like you do where you can vote for the board of directors and, and stuff like that, some of the proxies that you get. Uh, and that any part of phase one that is approved will have that 20% assessment. So if you're only to approve two of the three projects, whatever two of those projects you approve, that 20% assessment would apply to that. So for example, if you approve the golf course and tennis, it'd be the 20% assessment, and then you just wouldn't, the 20% the on the, the gatehouse wouldn't happen or vice versa, whichever one of those occurred. So now we're at the uh, time for Q&A, but before I do that, I want to just tell you that when we get done with the Q&A today, you have this in your lap. Uh, it's a eight question survey. If you open your phone to your camera and point it at this or at a, the QR code on the TV, it will open up a brief survey for you. And it's very important for us to try to get your feedback to understand if we hit the mark or we didn't hit the mark or give you the opportunity to give us any other feedback that you want to give us so that the board and our professionals here can consider anything that you have. So with that, we're going to bring the professionals back up and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir, Mr. Well, I have three questions. Okay. First one is financial. Yes, sir. And, and I, I just missed it. How many new members per year do we need in this plan? So uh, this year was 35, next year is 40, then we go back to our normal of 45. 45, that's $75,000 per member. Yes, yes, sir. Joining fees. Yes, sir. That's the only financial question I have. I have two questions on the golf course. Okay. One is hole number five, which I think, in my opinion, most of us find the most boring hole. Right. On the yeah. course. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you doing to that hole to make it more exciting? Pretty phenomenal. Right, so I that's, just missed it. That's all. Yeah. So the so that's where those five holes come together. So the tees are actually part of that high apex of the hill. So it'd be first off is that it becomes a downhill tee shot, right? So that'll become much more visual. The second thing is that the the berming is actually part of that. So as we started to show you the contouring in the fairway, so instead of a flat fairway, that becomes much more contoured. The third thing in is, is that the backdrop of the green becomes another perimeter berm. So you actually have a downhill tee shot, but then an uphill approach shot. And then that becomes another amphitheater green setting like we talked about, like, like Augusta, like 18 years old. Thank you. Last question, number, current number two, you number 10. Okay. Can we see that on the screen for 30 seconds, please? And I have one question. And I live on that hole, that's why I haven't done it. Okay. <laughs> you live on the corner? No, I don't live on the corner. By the way. I, I'm four houses down. Okay. From the start. From the picture, uh, you're the one you can see the pool, you know? Somebody <laughs> leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to see what everybody is doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The uh, slider. Is it? Uh, no. Is it? <laughs> There. Go into the final. <laughs> That's not that one. No. No. Yeah. yeah. There's another internet tab. All right. You know, we'll just get it through the PowerPoint. Yep. Go to PowerPoint. As he's looking for it, you know, one general comment. I think it's very well done. You know, yes. and, uh, oh, you good. Well, well. Golf course is such exciting. I'll get you there, Jason. There you go. Hold on, hold on. 
We have a lot of this clicking because we're trying to uh, bring Andy, it up like Andy, this and it zoom. Andy, you may want to share that, right? There you go. Yeah. yeah. So the people on Zoom can see. I can bet. I couldn't do it either, so I'm not I'm not laughing at him. I'm laughing with him. Uh, here you go. I'm not sure which which home which home are you here? Um, are we on the right course? Number two. Number two. Number two. I live. Here. Number two. I, I live. Up. You here? Right? Yeah. yeah I there. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. This is the question I have. I was looking at the back. The question I have. I really enjoy my view of this. Yes. You won't lose that. That. What is that? Save trees. The so trees whatever trees are, are there. there. Oh, okay. That's all, the only question I have. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Bowman. How about followers? How about number one? Oh, one. 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 Across You're across the street. The street. You're across the street from the green. The middle of the right, right, right where your hands are. Right there, right there. We're right there. Right. right. View of the hole. We have a beautiful view of the hole. Okay. It's that perimeter. How does that work? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it, it's a mess, but we are uh, we're very aware of it and tuned into it and trying to. There are ways to fix that. Right? Yes, so there. It, you, know, but you can do verification. Absolutely. The third thing too is is that right now the North Course lakes don't have any other source of. So now in the South Course you have effluent feeds, so it's blended water and you can yeah. keep it at a more consistent level. The North doesn't have that, so in the new irrigation plan they would be able to do that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm just wondering: is there any fountains that can be put in some deep ponds? Fountains that you see, like over at Florida, they have two fountains when you zoom in. There's a couple of fountains. I know they're quite expensive, but sure. there's nothing like that that can put in. It makes the water move a little better. Certainly, you can, and and you can also. They're not that expensive, and you can also put what's called bubblers in them that that don't have the fancy show of the water, but create the oxygenation. In the ponds. Right. And there's actually ones that you can do that are solar powered too. So they just have a simple solar uh, panel and then they have bubblers to keep it all aerated. Because then, even if your water is shallow, it still gives it. That's right. It needs, it needs more oxygen. Yep. Yeah. Hey, it would be an answer for a couple of years. <coughs> Cer certainly getting more oxygen in the ponds is what. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Quick, quick. Can you slide the screen over a little bit? Because I'm in Partridge. Um, you know, so what you're doing, I'm not sure we're on, I'm not sure we're partridge. So, you go, go to the go to the yeah, right. You're going to have a pathway coming down towards my house, just right here, yeah. And I live right there, right? So, how far down are you coming? Are you ending it before? Oh, yeah, you're you're not going to get in. We, if anything, we would make sure that that's really buttoned up through there because I actually I see your neighbor over here kind of cutting through occasionally. Yeah. Uh, and we I would, like to do that too. Sometimes. Yeah. So <laughs> so we we could leave that over here, but because uh, I'm right there. Yeah, you're you're, you're uh, right here. And so. I but I like a little opening because I love to look at our beautiful clubhouse. Okay. So I don't I don't want. That doesn't say landscape. That's save the vegetation. The vegetation that's there. Yes. Okay. We, wanted, we wanted to make sure that if anybody lived there, like yourself, yes. that you want to get all the balls cut. that come up with it. I really don't care because I put them on, around my mailbox. So, from <laughs> <laughs> so everyone knows. Like, I just want to know how far that path is down. It doesn't wrap back behind your yard. And I think you've done a great job for everyone. Well, you know, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Mr. Mr. Lagore, you, and then I'm going to go to the back. Okay. Just uh, two things. One is, do, I'm going to get the golf course in a minute. Do we have extra meeting space in the pension van? I know we've talked about that. Yes, sir. It looks like we do, so we can accommodate the overflow from the clubhouse. Yes, sir. That's Book good. club, Bible study, card groups, uh, yeah, that's any of that. Yes, sir. And the other thing is, um, on the south course, on the sixth hole of the south course, there are gullies around the green. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? And I think you said about putting gullies on the north course. I think those gullies are tough. I know they're there for drainage, but boy, there you get in one of those gullies and you're in trouble. I don't, sir. I don't know what you mean by gullies, but well, I don't... big swale right next to the green. Well, sometimes you do that for certain challenges, but you know, it, again, it's completely different style. That north, excuse me, south course is what we call that penal or rejection golf. But we don't want to do that on the north course. Well, we don't want that either. But I just. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that that's a that's an issue. Uh, those those deep swales are an issue in my view. So okay, yes, sir. Are you adding acreage to the green complexes in total, and are how many more acres of fairway development are you going to add? Uh, the greens, I would say, are approximately about the same. I mean, even if you look at hole number one, that's right here. You know, it's about the same. Uh, and I would say that same as in what used to be, you know, what happens in Florida in particular in warm season turf grass, your green perimeters, if you go out there right now, they tend to shrink over time. So if I were to go show you where the greens used to be originally, the mix that's underneath it, they would actually be bigger than what you have now. Um, the fairways, yes, the fairways get bigger. I don't have an exact number. You know, if I were to make an educated guess, I'd probably say 20% more acres. And I think it's worth noting, too, the bunker space gets much smaller. Yes, it is worth noting that because people start to look and they look at all the different bunkering that's on there. But it's actually, well, I can, the, I will give you the precise number because somebody asked that yesterday and I texted during one of the meetings back to staff. And, so the bunkers, your existing bunker area right now, right? So your square footage is 149,000 square feet. 
So if you look at the plans, the totality of everything is 100, including the Chorkium area, is 109,500. So we've dropped off uh, roughly 40,000 square feet, which is just slightly under an acre. So think about how big of an acre is. So it's Alex Sandler. Talk about the South Course. I hate to do that. I have to do all the sand traps. Yes, sir. But on the front, you have more on the north. Yeah, that's where you can take sand throws if you use them. Uh, you know, that's up to Chris. I mean, that's that right. I mean, quite honestly, it's much better conditioning if they're handbrake. I mean, so I don't know what Chris does or has the ability to do. Um, you know, once we get to the actual physical shaping of that bunker, much of that gets handcrafted in the field. And we literally, when we build a bunker, and then we have Chris come out and look at it and say, okay, you know, is this, you know, does this look good to you? Uh, you know, from a maintenance standpoint. So if we, if, Yes, sir. And then, and then we're going to answer. We've got about nine chat questions going on online. We'd, we'd like to answer those. Before. One more question. I've asked it earlier. <clears throat> so, when are you going to start? And, hey, you know. gonna take? <laughs> <laughs> and what are we going to do in the meantime? Are you talking about for golf, or but for the whole project? Yeah, golf. Okay. So, for golf, I mean, every, every type of project like this, and there are literally dozens of them every year in Florida, they always want to start in March sometime and then and, and reopen in November. So that would, you know, that becomes the target. And I'll give you an example. You know, Bill had mentioned Bel Air. You know, it started. That's the oldest club in Florida, by the way. So that club is over in Clearwater. It was built in 1897. So it's roughly about a, a little over eight million dollar rebuild of the golf course. They shut. They excuse me. They uh, let the contractor mobilize three weeks ago. What that meant was they still maintained the golf course being opened. They allowed them to come in and drop equipment off and, you know, off in the perimeter places, bring their office trailers on, start putting up perimeter silt fencing and things like that. Again, people still play golf and they didn't shut the golf course down until March the 20th. So it was just, they've only been at physical construction just for under a week right now. Their target is to reopen November the 1st. I told them, say American Thanksgiving, and they go November 1st. And I said, well, I'm going to continue to say Thanksgiving because I'm going to be the one that probably looks a little better, but it's going to be in that gap sometime. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that, you know, Mr. Langley talked about with the hedging on the, um, on the monetary side of things, again, we were very careful. We put in 20 acres of sod. We also have contingency across all of this. So if we, for example, you get a bad tropical storm or hurricane and we get set back, well, then we know that we're able to bump it up if we have to go to 25 <laughs> acres of sod. And then we can get it back on schedule for a reopening in November. When do you expect to get the boat cracks for the boat? Uh, so we actually chatted a little bit about that this morning. Uh, we think it's important to do a uh, uh, a meeting with respect to um, uh, the environment, uh, particularly as to the use of Roundup prior to asking for a vote, so that we can answer those questions for the folks that are out there. And so uh, we're going to call. We, we, decided on an expert well we have an expert in the room but we decided on another one that we would ask to come and, and we've got to check their schedule but uh right now it looks like we would be headed towards somewhere around the 18th or uh or as for a called town hall to introduce the proxy package 18th of april uh and then about a two-week voting period uh, after that so so that we would know by the end of april or early May. Uh, so some of it's critical. So if I can hold here and just answer the question for the people on Zoom just a second. There's really not many questions. Uh, so the, the, the first one, Jason, is for you. Are you planting water on the right of 18th South? And what's the brown line? I mean, the answer is yes, there's water on the right of 18th South. 18th, well, it's, it's, it's right by the tee box. It kind of, it's, it's on oh, the but it would be side. in play. So yeah. they'd really have to push it right. Or right, it, it would not, right, it would not be important. No, it's on the right side of 18 North and the brown line is the bridge that we discussed. So, uh, and does that make it a par four for women? The 18th hole? 18th hole. I believe it does. Yeah. Uh, slides are going to be available. Yes, the slides are gonna be available as early as this afternoon. Uh, how high is the berm on the right side of current number five? Or current number five. Current number five, there is no berm to the right. Yeah, there is no berm now. And there is no berm so now. There wouldn't be a. Uh, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's, 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 that's the Daytona. So that's the one you hope to get. Uh, the, the current five is oh, oh, by oh, the T box oh, is oh, your oh. highest point, and then you got. 
Okay, I Down got it. I got my I, Mr. Benedetti's question. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I mean the berms would be anywhere from roughly uh, eight feet up to twenty feet. So you know, part of that depends on permitting. So it's just a, within that gap. Now uh, that's the again I point that out because people ask that question. That's the earthwork. By the time you put the vegetation on it, you know, depending upon where it's at, that could be yeah, higher. Jason, we're talking about the right side of the making the saving the same tree uh, notation there. There's no berm, right? There, there is no berm on the oh, right side. Oh, so there's no berm. Either. Either. Yeah. So no trees. Yeah, we're, we're not hiding anything from the no. condos on the right side. No, not at all. Uh, so then the, the next question, when you in, anticipate starting a golf course? Uh, and so we just answered that one. Uh, yes, it was a brutal this year with two functional golf courses. We, we absolutely agree with you. So, uh, so we have a history as a club here of helping other clubs. And uh, for example, um, Woodfield, a couple of years ago when they redid their golf course, uh, asked us to start allowing their members to, to start playing the 1st of April uh, when they shut down theirs. We would go back to them and several, several local clubs and ask for that same right. So uh, you, just like before when we did the South Golf Course, there will be a period where the fairway and rough gets sprayed out. The greens would stay, uh, stay full and functional until we shut it down. Uh, and so, you know, some of you liked playing on it where you got more roll, uh, <laughs> where, where it was kind of dried out and, uh, and, 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 and dying. But uh, uh, that would be our intent. Our intent would be to negotiate with as many clubs as we could, other access, and Dan and his team would handle, uh, would handle that. Um, let's see here. So we are you planning on using Roundup? The answer is yes, but we will have an informational meeting uh, coming up before the before the town hall. Yeah. Uh, how will we address the noise from anticipated activities into the evening? Uh, I, I I guess I would say the same way we handle it at the clubhouse. Now we try not to bother the people that are in Kitty Wake too much and. Uh, the Kitty Wake units are very close there to the outdoor main dining terrace there now, uh, and we haven't had an issue with it. So uh, most of our members here are, are kind of done by by nine. It's uh, uh, nine 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 thirty. You know, when I when I came here, somebody said we practice HBN here, and I said, "What's that?" They said, "Home by nine. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so it, it it happens occasionally. So. Uh, the grass has not come in very well on the south course. Many places no grass. Uh, well, I I would say to you that the bimini grass has outperformed any other grass in South Florida. And Chris is in the room and he can certainly speak to it. Uh, some of our areas where we have no grass uh, is just because of all the play that we've had this year, and it's just been it's been a brutal season and and. We certainly don't want it to be like that going forward, and you all know that. And, and we're going to do everything we can to fix it. Uh, know the par four question related to 13 North. It is currently a par five for women border across. Does it become a par four? Current 13. I'm going to get my. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> That'd be the dog leg. Dog leg going up to the left. number five. Yeah. Uh, that would be a par four. It'd be a part two. I believe so, yes. The part five not for me. Part five the rest of the yes, but yes, it's yeah, yeah those, those T's got moved forward. Those T's get moved substantially forward. forward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, so we we'll, so we we will be able to do all the new work over there unimpeded, but there will be a time where we have to shut it down to demolish the old one and do the tie-in with the road and everything. Uh, and we would try to time that so that that is done out of season as much as possible and, and then give everybody plenty of notice and then we would just have to use the North Cape uh, during that period of time. Uh, the other thing we may be able to do is may be able to get the new inbound lane open uh, for the uh, for the members and, and be able to use some handheld stuff and bring everybody in that way while we're going over to the other side. A lot of logistics we still will need to work out. 
Yes, uh, ma'am. Then I'll the, come back. The party in the north uh, course, how is Audubon dealing with it? Are they uh, very so exciting? They're very excited uh, about all of the uh, environmental stuff that Jason brings to the table, particularly the aquatic plants, the enlargement of the lakes, which gives more space for wildlife. Uh, uh, very excited, and they've already started working with trying to figure out where they may move, like the screech owl boxes mm -hmm. and some of that stuff too. And so, uh, I, I would tell you that they were at the first meeting, I think, that we had. Uh, that in members were at, I think, all. Yeah, they were different members of each of them, but. Uh, but particularly Mr. Waggy uh, spoke uh, uh, very favorably and, and you know, was excited about working with Jason and, and the Audubon to, to create something special up there. Wasn't there a little issue with the new south there, of course? So there was not as many uh, aquatics put in the water and we're maintaining the grass edge, uh, the clean cut edge all the way to the water. Uh, and so uh, up on the north course, we're adding many more look, what's called littoral shelves that he talked about earlier that, that has the aquatic plants in them and will be much more favorable to birds and wildlife and, uh, and amphibious animals. So. Last question on the 15 of the sort south course. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago, they really trimmed down every high weed on the left of the water. Across the water. Yeah, across 15 the water. South. Yeah, the par three. Uh -huh. And I was thinking about all the nesting and all the wildlife, wildlife there. Why was it uh, cut down? It, Chris, do you know? Is that was that David? Yeah, that was. That was okay. So, on the other side of the pond, on the yes. Uh, Okay, so I, I that is that is what's called a like a bahia grass, I think, over there, Chris, isn't it? Uh, which is which is kind of a, a native grass that uh, about once a year they need to go in and be able to cut that down to to allow it to propagate correctly. But I'm not sure why it would have been done right now. I'd, I'd have to ask David. So. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, on the tenth, you know when that will be done. So I don't know yet. Uh, and talking with Mr. Carroll the other day, and, and Brian has to leave. He has another function he has to go to. Uh, she she wanted to start yesterday. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, so it, it will take a while. It, assuming a positive vote, then it's going to take them several months to get through uh, their their full set of plans, or get to a set of plans where we can get pre-construction pricing. Uh, and then further along with the engineers, you know, once once they get uh, a certain, they typically uh, plans are done where you get like a thirty percent progress set, and a sixty percent, and an eighty percent, and a hundred percent. At thirty percent, it goes to the engineer because they by that time they figured out the roof trusses and stuff like that. But the engineer then has to figure out how all the AC duct works through the uh, the roof trusses to come together. So. Uh, I, I expect that take to most of the summer and that we would be at a position where we could get some pre-construction pricing in early fall. And then we'll work with the tennis and fitness committee and depending again on the vote, whether you start it during this season or you wait to the very, to, to about this time and then, and then get it going. Now, financial team, we have a lot of outside members. Thank you all for coming. Will it be considered to increase? Like they get a lot of benefits. Yes, ma'am. We have we have seventy uh, non-resident tenant participants. Uh, according to our bylaws, we cannot assess them because they are not members, just like the summer participants. But we can consider going up on them significantly from where we're at now. And I think we see us do that, just like we did with the sub this year's summer participants. Yes, ma'am. Do we have the same issue as the uh, non-resident drop members and assessment for any of them? No, the non-resident they, they, they are members, so they absolutely are assessed. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just on back on the tennis, uh, we did the permit work, et cetera. Could we start work in the winter? Can we still be able to use the tennis courts, right? Maybe two or three down. Is that realistic? That I, I don't. I don't see why it wouldn't be. You know, we, we're just going to have to get the plans advanced to a point where you can get into the permitting phase and get the demo permits and stuff like that. 
and then make sure you've got a contractor that's available and ready to, to be able to slide it in. Right, we wouldn't have to wait till April or May of next year if we're ready to go. I'm personally indifferent to it. it you know, it's just uh, as as to you know, it, it just seems to be uh, that as I know, the tennis folks are. And you wait a long, go go very go patient, wait a long time. And the permit's there, it'll, it'll yeah. happen. So then yeah. come to question how much inconvenience you want to bear. I mean, do you want yeah. to cut out the lion's share of the season only to start early in the next season? Or do you want to preserve the lion's share and just be disrupted in the first yeah. Yeah. two months? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, so yeah. Part, part of that would be getting a Gantt chart from a contractor as to exactly how long you think it's going to take them to build a building. Absolutely. Well, good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we certainly appreciate you taking the survey. Uh, please take the survey for us so we understand. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Is there any more? Any more uh, questions from Zoom? Quick. We outlived a few hours. <laughs> yeah.